On this episode, we discuss Bloodshot. A phrase that is never mentioned during the movie. That's Is that true? I can't tell. No, they never yeah, say Bloodshot. I don't bloodshot. think they ever call him Bloodshot. I no. think yeah. they call him Bloodshot. I think Guy Pierce says, you are Bloodshot now, when he wakes up. <laughs> he <laughs> says, he says you are now. the Bloodshot now, dog. <laughs> <laughs> Hey everyone, and welcome to the Flophouse. I'm Dan McCoy. Hey, I'm Stuart Wellington. I'm Elliot Kalen, owner of a brand new hot water heater because mine was leaking. Okay, how's everybody doing today? Save that juicy <laughs> uh, talk for after we introduce our guest. You know, not him. juicy, leaky. <laughs> you know our guest <laughs> from The Tick, where he played Arthur. You know him from the Blank Check podcast. You know him for being. Uh, a tie for uh, my girlfriend Audrey's second favorite podcaster after Hallie Hagland, tied with Elliot Kalen <laughs> for second favorite podcaster. I assume I'm in the top 25 at least. Uh, mm, don't make an assumption, Dan. You know what happens when you assume. <laughs> it's Griffin Newman, yeah, yeah, yeah. everyone. Hello. Hi. Uh, if you can please add to my uh, credits... Uh, Griffin Newman, world's number one bloodshot fan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a real Vin addict. When, right? I'm, when... I'm a Vin addict. I'm a, I'm a big Vino. But I also, I feel like truly, I may be the only person who has voluntarily watched this movie two times now. <laughs> yeah, Stuart. And, uh, Stuart said you were watching it. And I'm like, I follow him on Instagram. I'm pretty sure Griffin has already seen Bloodshot. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, wow, I got, which only sounds a little creepy there, right? <laughs> I, I got a lot of new stuff on the second viewing, and I am not joking at all. I, I oh, am wow. so happy I spent the extra hour and fifty giving it another run. So before we get into Bloodshot, because on this podcast we watch a bad movie and then we talk about it, uh, Griffin, I want to know what, what is it about the D's, and I'm talking about, of course, Eddie Deason, that really speaks to you, <laughs> that you're such a big fan of him. What is it about Vin Diesel that like you really relate to so much? Because you are a big Vin, Vin head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's taken me a while to fully analyze what it is uh, that, uh, uh, you know, attracts me to him so much. Because it's, you know, it's what is love? How do you define it? You know? <laughs> well, yeah. let's say, yeah. let's try to, let's try to kind of uh, graph it out. Some kind of Venn diagram, if you will. This, uh, this is what I will say. I think uh, an ex-girlfriend of mine uh, summed it up the best because any ex-girlfriend of mine essentially has to take an undergraduate course on Vin Diesel. Uh, whether mm-hmm. or not they want, not like as a prerequisite, but it comes with the yeah. territory of spending as that much. As a post-requisite. Uh, yes, it's a post-requisite <laughs> once they've signed up to spend time with me. Um, there's a heavily curated playlist of things that we have to watch. Uh, some short form, some long form. But uh, I was explaining uh, my love of Vin Diesel and my love of uh, Guns N' Roses, who are my favorite band of all time. And, mm-hmm. and she said, I get it. I think I finally get it. You like things that are like a parody of masculinity. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. There is I, definitely. I mean, a... I get the appeal to some extent. You know, I, you guys all know I'm pretty into D and D, and by that I mean Diesel and D's nuts jokes. <laughs> <laughs> That's my old joke, guys. Now, I, That's good. That's I good. I have to admit it, a it, certain it, amount of confusion about this because, like, I like Vin Diesel, but I'm not quite sure why. You're not because, in like with him. Because I feel like in his non-voice acting roles, he does not exude much in the way of personality. Well, oh, I, I disagree with you there. Yeah. Well, I, I want to hear your defense, say. Elliot. Oh, no. I think, I think kind of a... A uh, caricature or an exaggeration of masculinity makes sense to me. Vin Diesel, even when he's playing a serious part, is always pretty. Is always winking. There's like always Xander a part Cage. of him. When he's playing a serious part, like Xander Cage or Pitch Black or uh, Fast, because he's in Fast and the Furious. <laughs> his Fast. character is Johnny Fast, <laughs> and then uh, the late Paul. Be- Paul I was going to say Paul Bettany. The late, the late Paul, Paul Bettany. Is, oh, God forbid. Is, is of course is of course Roger Furious, but uh, it's. <laughs> That there's something about him that's always kind of like about to look at the audience and be like, can you believe I get to do this shit? <laughs> and I really find that endearing about him, that he he doesn't – of all – if you compare him to someone like um, – ironically, 
Jason Statham, who is a much winkier performer, I get the feeling that he's like, no, 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 I could do all these things. If you asked me to do them in real life, I could do them. Whereas Vin Diesel is like, this is all made up craziness. Like, let's just blow it out. Let's have fun with it. Like Griffin, is that how you feel? Or a hundred percent, you you nailed that perfectly. And I think if you want to like establish, you know, three points on a masculinity scale, right? <laughs> and it's <laughs> cinematic masculinity, like our modern action star, right? And it's Statham, The Rock, and Vin Diesel. And I'm not ranking them in terms of uh, quality, although Vin is obviously the top. But I'm saying, like, if you look on the wow, spectrum that's, here, I mean, Statham is a is a pretender. To there's that a, one, but I, there's, there's a, a lot, lot of rock bald fans. dads out there I that are angry. I mean, I'm, I'm, gotta, I'm throwing this out. I'm throwing this out. I, I just don't, I feel like we're running down Statham a lot more than I'm comfortable with because I feel I, like he, I love I love Statham I love Statham yeah. but I do think there's a distinction which as Elliot said Statham is more openly winking to the audience right mm. whereas Vin has a greater level of sincerity than Statham but is also more self aware than The Rock who is so fully buying his own bullshit you know yes and Vin's like right between the two Statham for me, though I love him, is a little bit too winky to be able to fully emotionally invest in him as a protagonist. The whole movie is always in quotes. And then The Rock is buying his own bullshit a little bit too much. And I think Vin is this perfect balance in terms of the like machismo baldies of the 2000s and on. <laughs> where, where he like means everything he says in like a John Wayne kind of way, where it's like it does not resemble normal human behavior, but it is imbued with as much emotional integrity as possible. But he is also so aware that he is himself like a special effect. Like his voice, the fact that his name is goddamn Vin Diesel, which was by choice, like <laughs> well, everything about it. Yeah. Someone once told me that the name Vin Diesel he came up with because when he was young, he spent time around uh, around in the drag community, uh -huh. I guess. And there's something about him that is like Dra drag racing, right? Drag racing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's a, no, Both. but there's something is there's something in him that is kind of like a a I assume I don't know anything about his personal life. I have always assumed he's straight, but I don't know. Like a straight man who is like, I am going to totally absorb into me that kind of like uh, comment on masculinity that is part of drag, you know, and I'm going to make that part of my persona in a way that is both straightforward and both commenty. I, but he, it's weird that like when you talk about bald masculinity, the person I would compare Vin Diesel the most with, strangely enough, strangely enough, is Telly Savalas. Yes. Where <laughs> yes. It was where I had a similar sense of like, this guy means what he says, but he also knows that what he's saying is kind of crazy <laughs> and like, but he's going all out with it, you know. Elliot, I hate to tell you this, but I, but I might fuck you by the end of this episode. Oh, no. <laughs> so turned on. Oh, man. You are taking things out of my mouth. Things I, I, A, have said about Vin to other people, and B, things I have never even figured out how to verbalize before. <laughs> do, you know, do you know that Kojak is one of Vin Diesel's favorite characters of all time? For the last five no. years, he's been trying to set up a Kojak movie. That's crazy that he hasn't been able to set up a It is his movie. dream job. He has it set up at Universal where he makes the Fast and Furious movies, and presumably he should be able to make whatever the fuck he wants, and he has been yeah. announcing it for five years that he's doing a Kojak <laughs> movie. As, he as be, a tribute he, to his mother, who apparently he used to watch it with her all the time, and it was his favorite when he was oh, a that's child. that's very sweet. He would be yeah. a great Kojak. I wish that he was not... They'd have to find some way to make him not look like... A superhero, yeah, at least a little bit, maybe a mustache, but <laughs> like, he, well, if but you've like ever <laughs> seen paparazzi photos of Vin on vacation in between movies, I will say I uh -huh. think he has the capacity to look like not a superhero, and he is also, <laughs> and I say this with all due respect, fifty-two years old. A fact that I re like to circulate as much as possible is Vin Diesel and Paul Giamatti were born one month apart. <laughs> <laughs> so he puts a lot of effort into same, being Same doctor. As, same, same doctor. doctor delivered the boat. <laughs> same, same doctor, yeah. same room. Uh, <laughs> so you're yeah. saying that the modern version of twins is the Vin Diesel and Paul Giamatti playing the <laughs> yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito roles. This is like a Salman Rushdie... Uh... Magical realist novel. <laughs> yes. And I'm, and I'm also saying, with all due respect, because it is, it, it is a testament to his work ethic, but pretty much I'd say give him one lazy weekend and Vin Diesel can no longer look like a superhero. <laughs> Stuart, okay, this, is very, Stuart, this is very stupid, but I need to get this out. Please. Vin Knight's children. Yeah. 
Oh, All right, that's yeah, it. Vin Knight's children. Yeah, there I like it. Yeah. No, it's perfect. Um, and to go back to <laughs> comparing Vin Diesel and The Rock, one of the things that I I feel like I prefer, uh, one of the things that gives Vin the edge for me is I don't feel like at any point in the future am I going to have to worry about having to vote for or against yep. him in a political <laughs> race. Yes, yes. I feel like there is something to him for as much as he is like, was one of these guys who is tip of the spear on social media, is constantly posting like, fan art of himself with like live love create <laughs> happy friday and shit like that yeah. it feels like he has cultivated less of a cult of personality around him than someone like the rock who is also selling us like his fucking workout equipment and his like tequila yeah. and is constantly yeah. towing that line of like i don't know do you want me to be president and i also <laughs> think as you said like the rock wants to be and I'm sorry that I'm going to go hard after The Rock here, but you have to if you're ever talking about Vin Diesel. If you really want to defend Vin Diesel's <laughs> honor, you have to compare him to The Rock. Because The Rock is the one who, who most people accept as the best at what he's trying to do, right? Which I yeah. reject. Because I think The Rock, A, is lesson on the joke and what we're talking about. I do think the key to Vin Diesel for me is, Elliot, as you said, that he kind of is giving a drag performance of an action star. You know, mm -hmm. it is like, uh, you know, he is doing to Arnold Schwarzenegger what like a drag queen is doing to Judy Garland in a yeah. certain way. It, it feels like the, the only thing that makes the triple X movies bearable is that Vin Diesel is like, whoa, this isn't real. Can you imagine right. this stuff? Like any any moment with him, he is playing it, it like it, if there if to have and I, and I don't mind knocking Jason Statham. I don't I don't have the same affection for him. But like if Jason Statham was in triple X return of Xander Cage, the moment when that room full of women makes him have sex with them to get his coat yes. back. And yes. it's like the things I do for my country. Jason Statham would say that in this kind of leering, like, yeah, I get to have sex with these women now. Whereas Vin Diesel was like, can you believe how silly this scene is? Yeah. Like, all right. <laughs> and I also think you look at the first triple X and the third triple X. And the third one is the one where it feels like he has claimed some level of authorship over the movie. And it uh -huh. is yeah. so much better and so much less toxic than the first one, which is Vin being yeah. self-aware in a movie that is kind of horrifying. <laughs> you know? Like the third one feels like it's totally on his level. We were all tired of our daddy's James Bond and it was time for uh, not our daddy's James Bond. Like I was like, oh, how many times is my daddy's James Bond going to be inflicted on me? And by the time the third Triple X came out, we were ready for Not Our Daddy's Triple X. Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> I just, I remember that when the first Triple X came out, and this is a, this is a quote I had to, re I researched because I remembered it and I want to make sure I got it right. And I used it in a presentation when we talked about Triple X before a live audience where the producer, or it was either the producer or the director was like, we basically took the best parts of Dirty Dozen and Kelly's, Hero and, Kelly's Heroes and smashed them together into one movie. And I was like, whoa. Like that's, that's such a hubristic thing to say. Like that's such a crappy thing to say. And but also, did. if that's what you thought you did, do you hate Kelly's Heroes and the Dirty Dozen? <laughs> like, yeah. Um, no, I mean, like I have affection for the first Triple X, but then, like, only on Vin levels, and for it being such yeah. a painful time capsule of the year two thousand three. But I think, like Triple X three, I was like, well, I've like, you know, I have to do my my duty as like a civilian and and go see the new Vin movie in theaters and then was surprised by how much I actually liked it and to go back to the rock thing it's like you go to Hobbs and Shaw where every character has to exist in a scene next to the rock to prove how masculine the rock is and it doesn't uh -huh. feel like it's a joke even though it is supposed to be a joke only in the sense that it makes the rock look funny so that you know he's funny on top of being kind and the toughest guy but also something mm -hmm. like that um, uh, Vanessa Kirby has to be yep. sexually attracted and uh, to The Rock in Hobbs and Shaw, despite being uh -huh. uh, 20 years younger than him. And uh, literally, uh, he is uh, a, a not a human in that film. Um, it is scientifically impossible that the two of them are together. Uh, whereas <laughs> in like Triple X, uh, State of the Union, or, or not State of the Union, I'm sorry, Return of Xander Cage, the third entry in the Triple X trilogy, uh, the two quote unquote, the last of the X's. Yes, There's triple X. This is the final X. Yeah, uh, X X triple I mean, X. God willing, cubed. Elliot. Who knows? Yeah, uh, yeah maybe they'll be triple X three. One more X. X nine. <laughs> um, but but in that film, the the two quote unquote hot girls are attracted to each other, yeah. which it just feels like is something that The Rock would never do. 
like have two hot women in a movie who are like, we don't want to fuck you. We're going to fuck each other. And it is not treated as a joke. And also there isn't a sex scene. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You turn me around. You all turn me around. (laughs) Right. There's like a certain generosity to Vin Diesel. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when we were watching Triple X 3 Return of Xander Cage, Mm -hmm. I got such a moment of genuine joy when Ice Cube showed up and like the audience I was watching it with just screamed, even though none of them had seen the second movie. (laughs) (laughs) But but isn't that like the entire power of what he pulled off with the Fast and Furious franchise is like Fast Five has the energy of this is the Avengers. We're finally uniting all of the greatest cinematic yeah. characters. And it's characters <laughs> that you ostensibly did not care about before. And you're like, but they got the guy from three and the guy from two. Like it's the same <laughs> franchise. And he made it seem like somehow it was like a world shattering crossover event. Yeah. So oh, speaking of world shattering crossover events. So bloodshot. Uh-huh. The movie we're ostensibly supposed to be talking about today. Yes. Although this has turned into a podcast about Triple X Return of Xander Cage, which is fine. I've already done uh, that one. <laughs> now, Bloodshot is the first entry in the Valiant cinematic universe. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. I don't know how familiar you guys are with Valiant comics, and if you wanted me to say anything Barely. about them or not. Oh, I mean, please talk about it. I mean, I'm only familiar with them in so much as I know that they were kind of a product of the 90s comics boom. And, yes. and, uh, I, and I know that my friend Alejandro is currently writing Doctor Tomorrow, which is great, and being yeah. published by Valiant Comics. I mean, the Valiant Comics of today is a very different publisher. Like, I've written stuff for Valiant Comics, like the current one. They actually have put out a, a number of good books now. But Valiant in the 90s was very much like Image had come out, Image Comics, and had toppled Marvel and, D- Marvel and DC from the number one spots for a little bit. And yeah. Valiant was a bunch of people who very talented people who had who knew comics who had long careers at Marvel and DC and were like we're going to create a new universe and they just couldn't quite capture the magic and eventually it was sold to Acclaim the video game maker and it was Acclaim Comics and now it's Valiant Comics again and it's kind of new versions of those characters but Bloodshot is kind of the Punisher of the Valiant universe as opposed to uh, Exo Man of Wars Iron Man or uh, uh-huh. Solar Man of the Atoms uh, Superman or Ninjax. Har- Harbinger Ninja, was I like guess. Harbinger was like the X Men, right? Harbinger was basically yes. the X Men. And now, if, if if this if Bloodshot does well enough, they have plans for a Harbinger movie. And there's also like, a, but Valiant was this. Uh, there was Rai and the Future Force. Valiant was this this world that like they also had they had some of the old Gold Key characters. So I think Magnus Robot Fighter and Solar in there. Now but like, wait, just let me pause yes. you for just a second. You said that. Yeah. Uh, he was the uh, Punisher of that universe. Did he use like guns and such a lot more in the comics? Because I watched this movie and I'm like, okay, he is nanotechnology Wolverine. Is, is well, what I he thought. always he always had that the nanotech in his system, mm-hmm. Bloodshot. But he basically used it in Punisher type missions to shoot people. You know, he okay. was like, if if Punisher and Wolverine were the same character, which might have been what they were thinking when they created him. Like people love the Punisher, they love Wolverine. What if they were one character? And you know what? Slap a chromium on that cover. Give that a chromium cover so it's real yeah. shiny. Die and we can charge two ninety five on the uh, not diecast. If you're thinking uh, of diecast chromium, I think that was the Turok Dinosaur Hunter co- number okay. one cover. Mm-hmm. But uh, but it was. But I see what you, and die cut. I think is what you meant. Diecast would be Sorry. like if you're making like Matchbox cars. But uh, someone write in and correct me. I might be wrong. I don't know that yeah. much about production techniques for these things. Okay. But, uh, Sorry, you had gotten up to gold key before I interrupted you. <laughs> no, no. But anyway, so that so Valiant was one of these companies that. Was never was kind of the number four company for a while, just because there was room for a number four company. Mm-hmm. There was no one, else, you know, after DC, Marvel, and Image, but they were never quite as big, and they've been through ups and downs. Now it's and now they're putting they put out a lot of great books, but like yeah, I mean, it was ed- back in the day when the only other option was reading uh, what the self published ElfQuest comics. I mean, that's a great option, or Bone from Jeff Smith's yep. cartoon books. Uh, the but it's like a it's a weird universe to use to try to make a film universe out of it. And when they announce this, it does feel a little bit like, oh, okay, this is the film universe that you could get because Marvel and DC were taken and Image does not exist as one. It's all creator-owned by their individual creators. Uh, and at that, and you're not going to go get a Malibu Press universe together because Marvel <laughs> bought and buried all those characters. So, Well, also, I will say, watching this movie, it was about halfway through that I'm like, oh, yeah, I think this is based on a Valiant comic. Because it doesn't necessarily feel like a superhero story so much as just, you know, like a throwback sci-fi action movie. Totally. Yeah. I mean, this same movie, I could see watching it on HBO as a teenager, like, 
in the middle of a Saturday, and I'd yes. be like, "Yeah, okay, this makes sense." I'm I, neither I, I'm neither surprised nor am I disappointed. <laughs> I, I was I was uh, my my sort of closest uh, uh, Vin uh, cohort in terms of the guy I constantly check in with uh, for Vin update updates. What, one of a couple people I uh, check in with after uh, there have been Vin updates in the world is uh, John Gabris of the High and Mighty and Action Boys podcast, mm-hmm. and uh, I I was like after i watched it for the first time telling him like my takes on it i was like it feels like uh a schwarzenegger in a racer zone like it feels mm-hmm. like it is pulled off of the timeline from 1997 um yeah. if i can offer a quick i feel like guy pierce is a slightly more intimidating villain than james Kahn. <laughs> maybe maybe <laughs> Um, I mean, this is this uh, this movie. Uh, it, rather than fitting into like a valiant cinematic universe, it kind of fits into a "Don't trust Guy Pierce as the head of a technology yes. company." <laughs> mm-hmm. Universe. Mm-hmm. I was like, "How many movies am I going to see where Guy Pierce yeah. is like an evil scientist mi- <laughs> businessman?" <laughs> Audrey uh, was I, like, "Has he ever just played a straight up like good guy?" I'm like, "Well, I mean, yeah, like confidential, Memento, but he was kind, kind of? of a dick." Yeah. And Time then machine. like lockout, but he was also kind of a dick. <laughs> like, I, I'm not sure. Um, if I can offer a quick addendum uh, to your Valiant uh, breakdown, Elliot, um, this movie was announced as Sony gets the Valiant Comics right, rights uh, for movie universe planned. And what they announced was uh, it'll be like Harbinger, Bloodshot, then I think Harbinger 2, and then they were going to do a crossover. That's what mm-hmm. I think was uh, sort of thrown out. And then when Vin got attached, Bloodshot became the first thing, and they were like, we will use this to launch uh, everything else. Um, And to your point, like the weirdness of trying to launch a Bloodshot Cinematic Universe, a thing I experienced (laughs) from working on The Tick is uh, very often these large companies that buy the rights to obscure uh, creator-owned comic book companies uh, and properties don't understand that everything isn't as popular as the Avengers. There's this like, <laughs> there's this assumption where they're like, well, they like comic books, right? So every character has as big of a built-in fan base. Um, but uh, th- that was announced. Bloodshot was announced as the first step of this so, thing. So you're, say- you're saying when they put out the American Splendor book, they were like, "This is just chapter one 100%. of the American Splendor cinematic universe. It's comics, right? Then we'll Where- do Mister Natural, right. <laughs> then Harvey P. Carr and Mister Natural crossover in the yes. sequels. We're Whereas, doing a uh, I'm like a comics fan who was alive through that period, and if you asked me for a Valiant uh, comics character, I'd be, I, after Turok, I would tap out. <laughs> so, yeah. Dan's that- dying for the Crazy Cat movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, I, I'm amazed that there is not already a, a movie out there that's like the Sunday Comics Cinematic Universe, but it's oh, all the yeah. public domain ones, so it's like yeah. Crazy Cat, Cats and Jammer Kids, like... Well, uh, well, there's that like the insane, kid, I guess. incomprehensible Nemo. looking new CGI Scooby Doo movie, which is that with mm. Hanna Barbera, where it's a new CGI Scooby Doo movie that's also simultaneously six other Hanna Barbera properties. <laughs> well, I mean, but Hanna Barbera's been doing that for decades because oh, totally. they have Laugh Olympics and they have yeah. Wacky Racers. And, but, oh, actually, the weirdest one is that Tom and Jerry movie that's also a Willy Wonka movie. <laughs> Yes, right, right. Well, there's that series of like the other ones are like public domain because there's Tom and Jerry Sherlock Holmes, Tom and Jerry yeah. Wizard of Oz, and then Wonka is so specifically Gene Wilder Wonka <laughs> with all the same designs and characters. But this is, I don't mean to drop a big bombshell here, but I was uh, doing mm. my research before we record it, and it turns out as seemingly the move of like uh, dumping things overboard uh, right before the ship hits an iceberg, uh, Sony. <laughs> like five months ago, sold off all the remaining Valiant rights before this came out. Oh. And so they were like, yeah, no, Paramount, you can make Harbinger. That's fine. So it seems like if any other Valiant movies get made, they will not be connected to this in any way, even though that was the explicit design of this movie. I mean, I'm going to tell you, I don't think Harbinger is going to get made because even as a kid, when that came out, I was like, what kind of a name for a comic is Harbinger? <laughs> like, it's such, it's such a weird word to like make your... To, to name a thing like i don't it doesn't yeah. make sense to me so uh, only, i certainly had trouble pronouncing it as a kid yeah only christopher nolan could get away <laughs> with a blockbuster called harbinger he's the only guy who can just yeah. put yeah. harbinger yeah. on a title yeah. and people go like that sounds smart like that actually yeah yeah <laughs> well, I, bet this has, I bet this is a movie about ideas yeah uh, mm-hmm. speaking about a movie that's not about ideas bloodshot mm. Stuart, do you want to tell us what happens in this movie yeah let me uh so we're about 30 minutes into the podcast let's start talking about the movie uh, <laughs> to be fine. fair to be 
fair, no, uh, we've been on point this whole time. This is uh, the book. Look, let me look at my seven pages of notes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Somehow somehow this is both the most time we've taken before talking about the movie and the most on topic we've ever been. So Griffin, <laughs> I appreciate you being here for that. <laughs> okay, Bloodshot. We, uh, the movie opens in Mombasa. Uh, we're introduced to Vin Diesel playing a character we know as Bravo Six. Later find out his name is Ray Garrison. Uh, he's talking to his buddy Marines over his headpiece. They're doing a lot of sit reps. He <laughs> disobeys a direct order and he breaches the what the the terrorist cell by himself and kills a bunch of terrorists and yeah, saves a, the uh, the hostage. Yeah, there's my, a house full of hostages and terrorists, and he just walks right in. My my note I wrote here is uh, Vin Diesel, casually fifty two year old soldier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's like it's it's similar to any time when Tom Cruise plays a soldier and you're like, uh, he's not a frontline soldier anymore, <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> right? This guy's like a grunt. <laughs> he has. I mean, maybe he was. I, I wouldn't be. Maybe if this was if this was a different time. If this was yeah, 10 like years the Civil ago, War. <laughs> well, no, but if this was like ten years ago, you could say that he was like uh, he was called back in. They were doing that a lot with people in the National Guard or people yes. who had, had their their hitch and they were being brought in for a new like. But I guess in the Navy they call it. They should have had like or a, their tour, I should say. A, like a, aren't you a little short for a stormtrooper scene? <laughs> He's like, right, aren't you a little <laughs> old you, for a soldier? Aren't you right. a little then, old like, going explains after. it. Well, but he's you know. so good at what he does. I mean, the real question is, at 52, he really should have been promoted much higher up the ranks. I was going to say, like, this guy hasn't thing. put in for a desk job yet. There are ways to stay <laughs> in the military. And I do think, I yeah. think you're right. There was a 10-year grace period where you could take any over a certain hill action star and say, look, after 9-11... They wanted to go yes, back into the battle. Called field. back in. Yeah. Right. He's fighting in Mombasa, so yeah. this is yeah. a this is like one of these operations that the public doesn't even learn too much about, <laughs> and so, and yeah. like where we're assisting <clears throat> local forces. So it's not like he is fighting the Taliban. And it makes me wonder. I don't know what Mombasa looks like, but where they were looked so generic to me that I want. It kind of felt like they. It was just supposed to be anywhere, and they just kind of named it later. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> this movie was shot entirely in uh, Cape Town, South Africa. Uh -huh. uh, I think partially because the director was there, and I assume they were able to get some sort of a government grant or tax rebate, but also because yeah. it feels like a place that looks like eight different places, so they could just shoot different areas and later decide <laughs> which chirons they would put over, identifying, oh, yeah. like, no, this is Australia, um, this is Madrid, <laughs> like, everything <laughs> is, just like, uh, Mimbaza. <laughs> this is that Italy, but a different part than the other part of Italy we were <laughs> right, in before. Right. That, that also explains why what, the first time we, he sees the skyline where his, like, the Guy Pierce's building is, I was like, I don't know what city this is supposed yeah. to be. Like, I don't recognize this skyline at yeah. all. And I, I, I don't feel, know the Cape Town skyline. So I feel pretty certain it. they did not pick the specific cities until 10 months after production wrapped. <laughs> they're like the movie is supposed to be released tomorrow can we name where it's taking place uh, you throw some chirons up they're in budapest now oh okay uh, so, so uh despite having a uh, an opening similar to the marine starring john cena wait is it john cena i don't remember um yeah. who's in the marine yeah um, you got it oh perfect nailed it in one um so he, he, there's no repercussions. He and his buddies go back, he, uh, and by buddies, I mean other Marines. Uh, they talk about why the reason they do this is because of Vin Diesel's wife, mm -hmm. uh, who he meets. <laughs> yeah, he's like, that's why you. That's why we fight, boys. And I'm like, wait, are they all married to her? <laughs> yeah, it's just like the, the end of Horse Feathers, Dan. They all married yeah. her in the same ceremony. Yeah, at the very least, they all covet her, and I mean, they've, yeah. fine. <laughs> they've been on a vow this of celibacy for 20 years, waiting for their chance. <laughs> They call him boss, which I was like, boss, I thought somebody else was giving him the orders, but don't worry about that. Uh, so they go for a walk along a pier, and then they have a candlelight love scene, and they talk it, about his stars. Like, it's like a very simple post-special ops mission vacation. He's going on his covert moon. That's uh, the little trip with his wife after each covert mission, where he yeah. just, you know, gets to... Forget about his troubles. They just go to the Italian coast. They <laughs> loll around in bed in their underpants because, like all married couples in PG thirteen movies, they wear their underpants when they're in bed together. Well, and then uh, they, and what else do they do? They just kind of hang around. They go to a fish market. No. And they're just laughing, loving, life. I mean, they're they're not 
they don't have the underwear on the whole time. There's a like a PG thirteen sex scene that happens, and they there's like, some side boob. Yeah, yeah. I don't know whether <laughs> this is actually the way it was shot in the movie or how I just remember it in the movie. But I remember them having sex in like one of those movie rooms that's like filled with a lot of tool, just sort of hanging from the ceiling, like <laughs> diphonious, like fabrics, just sort of like oh, thrown yeah, tool, around, like like the fabric. Yeah, yeah. I thought you meant tools, like the in a band. warehouse or like, <laughs> like, yeah, like a repair yeah, shop. Yeah, like hanging. Yeah, like the Cenobites are going to show up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like he get, Levin keeps hitting his head on the chains that are hanging above them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know if you guys know this too, but the the actress who plays his wife is uh, Tallulah Riley, who is also on Westworld, but was married uh, two separate times to Elon Musk. And I find that fascinating because she seems to only appear in projects that feel like they could have been written by Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. She's drawn to a certain type. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. and Dan, Dan, you're remembering it right. They're, they're basically having sex in like a, the video from I Will Do Anything for Love. Like a penthouse centerfold or something? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so and then, but Stuart, what happens? It sounds like the movie's over. Everyone's having a great time. They yeah, love yeah, yeah. It. Okay, Perfect so happy ending. mission accomplished. Unfortunately, the next morning, a team of two guys attack Bravo Six, aka Ray Garrison, aka Vin Diesel. Uh, he beats the shit out of them, and then as he's leaving, he bumps into a guy, and then he falls asleep. And you're like, I guess he got drugged. Smash cut. He wakes up tied with a uh, like hempen rope to a chair in a meat locker filled with meat. Uh, The guy who knocked him out shows up uh, and then dances to Dan's favorite song. At this point, I'm sure Dan was pretty into the movie, Mm -hmm. uh, Talking Heads, Psycho Killer. Um, I had the same thought when Psycho Killer started. I was like, oh, they're pandering to Dan right now. (laughs) You're also a big Talking Heads fan. I am. I am. But I just uh, when I think Talking Heads, I think Dan. Okay. This was the moment where I fully fell in love with the movie. I mean, I was like, I was pretty in just from the the name above the title. But the second we yeah. got to the the second best Valiant ever comics. use of Psycho Killer in a film, <laughs> I knew I was in love. Now, the first one I assume would be in my college screenplay, Psycho Killer. Correct, and then about... stop making sense as third. <laughs> okay, yeah, stop making sense as number third. Yeah. So, what was your uh, Psycho yeah, Killer screenplay about? This is a screenplay I wrote in a, one of my screenwriting classes at NYU, and it was about there is a there's a serial killer who is str- who is stalking New York, and uh-huh. a uh, a big time director who's had a couple bombs under his belt has decided he's going to go back to his indie roots and he's going to make a movie about this serial killer on the real locations that the serial killer is killing people, and the serial killer gets really interested in this movie because he's like, oh, this is what how I'm going to like this is how people are going to remember me, and and basically is stalking this director and like killing people around him to get him to do the things he wants in the movie and anyway it's like it was written by at me at a time when i really didn't know how movies were made so there's a lot <laughs> of stuff where i'm like using terminology that where i'm like if i look back at it now i'm sure be like that's not how that works that's not a thing you can do <laughs> that's not what craft services is <laughs> <laughs> yeah weird that They're you put like those into the screen directions <laughs> a lot of like smash cut rack focus too ultra close up that kind of stuff yeah <laughs> it's it's weird that you put in screen directions for what was going to be on the craft services table <laughs> i got look I, I was really building a world <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we we have forgotten about our pal Vin. Vin is tied once again with a uh, hemp and rope to a, an office chair. Inside Thank you for this specifying the kind of rope. I appreciate. <laughs> it. I just think it's kind of funny because up until this point, you're like, I bet this like they would use like high tech handcuffs, but no. Um, so uh, you think they're just going to be intimidating Vin Diesel, but nope, they bring his wife in. Oh man, they just crossed the fucking line. Uh, the guy then uh, uses one of those uh, pneumatic. Uh, pneumatic bolt pistol things and uh, asks Vin some questions that of course he doesn't know because they're above his pay grade and then he kills his wife anyway and then he shoots him in the face yeah end of the movie right now no nope. hold on now I want to say now uh, I'm not going to spoil the twist of the movie at this point even though the trailer does it uh, we will spoil the twist you know in another 20 minutes or probably an hour <laughs> the way we're taking the way we're time. talking, it'll be yeah. tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, Audrey was watching this with me. She's much more uh, vocal when we watch movies at home than than I normally would be. But like, she's like, you know, like chatting about the movie, and she's like, like at this point, she is not angry, let's say, but pointing out 
that this woman is like the laziest version of a wife in one of these situations where she's just waiting around at home to like <laughs> leap on him and have sex in this uh, drapery factory afterwards. Uh -huh. And then like she's immediately- Who do you think lit all uh, those candles? Uh, drapery yeah. showroom, Dan. Yeah. And then she is immediately fridged to give him a motivation. And there is a reason why this is also like- lazy that will will come up later in the movie but at this point you're like okay well i've seen this movie a million times before a hundred percent watching this for the first time without without getting to the spoilers yet watching for the first time i was accepting the sloppiness and the shortcuts and areas like that as like i guess this is what i fucking have to tolerate to get a vin diesel bloodshot movie <laughs> like as long as they get to the you know the good stuff i'm fine if like the setup is is sloppy watching it the second time I am actually kind of astonished by the artistry of how transparently clockwork all of that stuff is. <laughs> yeah, um, that's I also why I keep bringing up out, the rope. Yes, it, I also all <laughs> every single detail for me feels so perfectly chosen. Once you understand what the twist of this movie is, I also just want to point out the way you know that this is a film made by a director who understands Vin Diesel as a star because I stop watched it. I believe it is four minutes and 52 seconds in once they've landed the plane at the base and Vin turns to all his grunts and says, like, that's who we're doing it for. He wastes no time to immediately take off his uniform and reveal the wife beater un underneath, which is for Vin Diesel pulling off an outer layered revealing a wife beater is like Captain America picking up his shield. It is the moment, you know, you are cooking with gas. <laughs> Well, you know, Vin Diesel, uh, if, uh, he's had a lot of foes on film, but his mm -hmm. greatest enemy is sleeves. Uh -huh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Famously like overheated I'm... arms, Vin Diesel. Yeah, yeah. I'm, and I'm, I'm glad that he's never, he has yet to come across a necktie or a bow tie, because I feel <laughs> like that is a battle he cannot win. <laughs> no. Yes. I mean, the, so, the, uh, just to, to jump in, it was originally reported that Jared Leto was going to star in this film as Bloodshot. How different... Up to this point, do you think this movie would be if it was Jared Leto instead of Vin Diesel? Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you a big difference. I would not have seen it. Uh, I'd say that's an immediate difference. I would have no opinions on it other than my absolute revulsion at the very premise. Um, I also think, I think, like, the thing we're sort of talking around here is that, like, the movie doesn't work unless you, A, have someone who is an action star is proven in this genre because of what this movie is ultimately doing narratively, and B is someone who is so self-aware about how their action persona plays. If you cast it against yeah. type and pick a guy like Jared Leto and go like, it's Morbius, the, the thing is we've never seen a hero who looks like this before, then the whole thing is fucking nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, uh, so we get our opening credit sequence. Uh, we can only assume that Vin Diesel is dead. And then, of course, <laughs> nope, he wakes up. He's in a secret lab. Uh, he's in a secret lab, and he is introduced to uh, KT, a young cyborg woman. And uh, who is this? Uh, Guy Emil, Dr. Emil Harding, mm -hmm. who is played now, by Space Jail himself, Guy Pierce. Mm -hmm. Now, Guy Pierce himself. His casting is a clue to the twist of the movie. Um, Can you figure it out? Can you guess it? It's, he is one of those actors, and I love him as an actor. He's so yeah. good in Memento. He's so good in uh, the Proposition, the Western that he's in. Like, yeah. He's, but yeah. that, but like, the, he's like Max von Sydow at this point, where the minute he shows up, you're like, oh, the bad guy. <laughs> like, uh, but and, at the same time, like he brings, I think he brings something extra to it that like. Yeah, you might it might spoil the twist, but at least it's going to be fun the whole time. Oh no, he's yeah. he's he does this stuff great. I like it's it's in his sleep he can do this stuff, but it's at this point it's like I want to see him do something where I don't automatically know <laughs> the minute literally the minute I see his name yeah. in the credits. Well, it's like it's like in um uh Geostorm. Was it? Ge Geostorm. Yeah, when Ed Harris shows up and you're like, "Oh, the villain." <laughs> like, I love that I knew exactly where you were going. <laughs> yeah, that but, was that was pretty amazing. Point, it's like we were talking with our nanobots, yeah. To this point, I think like if you see Ed Harris's name in the opening credits of a film like Geostorm, you go, "Oh, he's the villain and he's going to sort of be phoning it in." Like this, I'm not going to get full Ed Harris here. He's yeah, not yeah. going to yeah. leave it all on the dance floor for fucking Geostorm. This is not a Pollock. He's not going to do that. This is not milk money. Right, right. 
<laughs> but whereas, like, if you see Guy Pierce in the opening credits, you're like, well, they've they've already spoiled for me that he's the villain, but I know he's going to have fun with it. Like, this guy is actually yeah. going to try to entertain himself playing this. Um, Stuart, just quickly, so. uh, because I feel like you glossed over this, <laughs> you said that KT is a cyborg. Now, I assume the parts of her body that have been augmented are something really cool that would help her fight. Like, <laughs> big robot arms. <laughs> Or laser eyes. Or maybe she has rocket feet. She's got, like, guns. (laughs) Well, we later find out that KT was a Navy swimmer. Uh Uh-huh. And she... Robot uh, legs can swim really fast. (laughs) Tell me, does she got a motor, a fan? What has she got? So she was horribly injured, and the only thing they could do was replace her, uh, what, she couldn't breathe? So they put in, like, a robot breathing tube in her neck or her chest. (laughs) But that's great, because that means that she, what, can, like, filter out... Like poisonous gas. Uh, yeah, she yeah. can. She can breathe. Uh, she can breathe through anything. Water, she's a, gas. She's like a human uh, Brita filter. It. Yeah. Now yeah. I I want to say that she is played by Isa Gonzalez, who uh who has been in um you know some fun movies like Hobbs and Shaw and Baby Driver, but she's also this is her fourth Flophouse movie. She was in Jim wow. and the Holograms. Wow. She was in Welcome to Marwin, and she was in Elisa Battle Angel. Which I don't believe released. we've released yet. Yeah, but we, yeah, but we, we did do it. it. That's the movie where, and spoiler alert for that one, where we talk about Dan's love of backstory and elaborate world building histories. I do things. not have that love. <laughs> that is something that has been placed on me because I asked for one line of explanation for a key plot point. But anyway, I, gotta I don't, say, know if I, I don't, I don't want to spoil the rest of the movie, but for a character with, let's just say, a limited power suite. Yes. They yeah. find many opportunities to use her powers for, for her benefit. I mean, that's that's imagination. That's what Jack Kirby would do. He'd say, okay, the Hulk is super strong. Okay, I could have him just punch and lift things, but what if he slapped his hands together and created a shockwave? What uh-huh. if he he jumped so far that he could basically fly? Like, what if he could blow his with his enormous lungs and knock people over? you got to find different ways what to use it, those powers. What if know? he went undercover as a robot clown working at the circus? <laughs> he, okay, he wasn't necessarily undercover. He was hypnotized, and they, and they disguised him as a robot clown working at the circus. It wasn't like okay. he did that as a plan. He just found himself in that situation. Now, that is a reference I can enjoy without actually knowing <laughs> what it's referencing. Thank. Well, it's a it's a it's a major part of Marvel history. <laughs> Imagine okay. for a, the Hulk for a is br- a robot clown, delights and amuses. No <laughs> for a very brief what time, he was for a very so brief time point, he was hypnotized into thinking he was a robot clown in the master okay. in, the, in the Ring Master of Crime Circus. Great, I love it. <laughs> so uh, at this point, uh, Doctor Harding explains that Bloodshot has been killed. He's been killed in action. And they brought him back, uh, that his body had been anon- anonymously donated uh, by the military, and nobody had picked up his body. He had no they just left ones. him in the drop box that side. <laughs> yep. They, yeah, they, they put him in. through a drop box. <laughs> they said, uh, please replace blood with nanites, which is what they did. Nanites <laughs> and, are nanobots and that this will is, they call heal it, any damage that is caused to his body. What's up? And it's, it's called Project Bloodshot. Uh-huh, Project Bloodshot. Now, so they, look. And they this... demonstrate by cutting his hand, and he goes, owie! And then, uh, and then we get a close-up of his hand, his hand healing. Now, it will surprise no one that the science of all this is questionable, but when mm-hmm. they say, like, oh, you put nanites in my blood, and she's like, no, your blood is nanites. I'm like, what? Important distinction. <laughs> There's I mean, no think, blood yeah. left. Yeah, he has and, no blood. He... He just says, I mean, to be honest, you don't, as long as you've got something that's going to bring oxygen and things like that around your body, you don't need blood. Sure, great. Uh-huh. But spoiler alert, there are a couple times in this movie where he basically gets blown apart and then he comes back yeah. together. And I'm like, uh, okay, I don't know if at this point nanorobots I, explains this. Well, the, and also, I, he, I, I do like that when uh, Dr. Harding cuts his hand to demonstrate his bloodshot powers, he does like, he's like, ow. And yeah, that is literally the only time in the rest of the movie when he's getting shot and blown apart. Part that he seems to register the uh, that's injury. A, that's a, that when he he has nanites that heal him, but like literally, he's being blown up. Half his head gets blown away and then reforms. It should hurt so much. But yeah. instead, he's just like, whatever. I don't care. Guys, like he feels no pain now. It's mind over matter. Okay, physical <laughs> yeah. pain is a mental 
prison because the whole point yeah. is Guy Pierce cuts his hand. He thinks it hurts because he doesn't know that he's yeah. fucking bloodshot yet. Yeah, yeah I see. Yeah, you're right. So every yeah. time, so now when he gets hurt, he's like, "Ow!" And then he looks at his tattoo that says, "You are bloodshot." And he's, and he's like, like oh, "Oh yeah, <laughs> never mind, right?" Because that no, that is a big. This is important detail. This is where this movie starts to start to you know riff on RoboCop and Memento. The Guy Pierce of it all becomes a little clear. He also doesn't remember who he fucking is. He doesn't yeah. remember shit. Yeah, he doesn't remember anything. He's introduced to a couple other enhanced soldiers. Tibbs, who uh, lost his eyes but now has robot eyes and can see everything. And then his uh, his, his enhancement is actually kind of crappy in that he has cameras on his chest and they're hooked <laughs> yeah. up to his eyes. So if he wears <laughs> yeah. a shirt or is not and is not wearing that harness, he, he's still blind again. <laughs> he's V-neck yeah. only. Yeah, and then uh, and there's Dalton who has a pair of robot legs, and Dalton is played by the guy. For, uh, he's that hunky Outlander fellow, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, now, and this again is a tip off that if someone has artificial legs, they're going to be the murderer, just like the real life artificial leg murderer. <laughs> okay. Um, wow. That's... Oh wow. Yeah, Dan but, doesn't want to get sued uh, by the uh, Oscar uh, Pistor- uh, Pistorius. Uh, Pistor- no. uh, this um, this movie above all else is anti Pistorius agaprop. That's that's the yeah, number yeah. one goal of this film. <laughs> The scene, the scene where the scene where Dalton uh, fires through a bathroom door at his wife and then tells everyone he thought it was a burglar. That seems pretty on the nose. Yeah. Look, I, just, no. I just want to say, South African director filmed in Cape Town. <laughs> that's yeah, that's uh, connecting the dots. So now, now Stuart, uh, now wait, but they're not the only cyborgs. Because what about Guy Pierce? Oh yeah, I forgot. Mm. Doctor Emil Harding has a cyborg arm that he lost in a tennis cancer accident. I think I can't remember. <laughs> yes, I don't. Yeah, know. he was. I think it's called just called a disease when cancer is involved. <laughs> yeah. I don't think there's an, a- an accident necessarily. Yeah. But they make it very clear that tennis was involved in some tennis way. Tennis yeah. was very important to him, but it also makes <laughs> him strong. <laughs> Actually, that would have been a pretty good joke if he was if he just had lift up his robot arm. He's like, yeah, tennis elbow. What are you gonna do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a very Jonah Hex reaction. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so uh, Vin Diesel has a nightmare about something or other. He punches the wall, and then he's like, wait, I can punch a wall? So he goes down to the basement, he starts punching the shit out of stuff and doing curls with the biggest weights. Yeah. Just, exactly wait. what we would all do if we got super strength. This right? is punching where, the shit out of a load-bearing uh, he's, pillar. He's punching a support pillar until it's cracking and the ceiling is dropping, and then he's like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that. But you guys are, are missing a very important detail. Tell, which is he is also laughing while doing this it is a, a, an amazing touch that he thinks this is so much goddamn fun already yeah yeah he, so he then he then watches uh, kt do some uh, underwater tai chi he's very impressed uh she gives him this spiel and hands him a coin then she starts doing uh, drinking a, with him she hands him a challenge coin, which okay. usually you're given. You know what? I guess she's giving it to him to like accept him as part of the group. Usually you get yeah. it for some sort of accomplishment, but she just kind of hands it to him, and that's a big thing, especially for these former military people. You don't just go handing out challenge coins willy nilly. So already you're like, oh, this is pretty, this is pretty hardcore for people who just met that day and who she doesn't seem to like him very much until yeah, this they've moment. gone through some shit. The, it, it's uh, the ultimate peer to peer currency, and I also want to point out that. Uh, they start drinking together, but it's not just, oh, let me take a bottle down from the shelf and we'll have some drinks. She steps over to a table near the gym where she's Uh been swimming, and there is a full (laughs) display of multiple different liquors and spirits. Because they work hard and they play hard. And sometimes sometimes it's like the prisoner. You go work for a workout, someone tries to kill you. You go to a bar, you realize you've been poisoned, and you have to drink a little bit of every single drink there, so you throw up the poison. It's just just like Patrick McGowan. If if there was a full bar at most gyms, I would be going to the gym on a regular basis. (laughs) And this This was was a very important point in the movie, too, because this was the point in the movie when I Googled, can Wolverine get drunk? uh, (laughs) Because... It'll, for me, you know, it raised a lot of questions for me. I mean, Wolverine, to, he, he has been drunk in the comics. Yeah, yeah. well, for me, the, this was the answer the... I got is that he needs to drink a lot more, of course, because of his healing powers. This is the one part of the movie that I gotta, I gotta give it some shit, Griffin. I gotta call it out because the reason they're drinking is because she's like, you lost your memory, you don't remember what, what you like to drink. And I'm like, that man knows he drinks fucking corona baby yep. <laughs> yep no i agree i agree it is actually a major logic flaw in the movie i don't like to point out plot holes but that that just does not track for one second he's got corona in his blood as much as he has nanites in his blood you can't now, pull that out of the man 
but we don't have time to focus too much on what he likes to drink because speakers that have not been set to any radio, as far as we could tell, start uh-huh. playing Psycho Killer, the song yeah, that was uh-huh. playing when in it, when he kills his wife, when, or when his wife Whoa. was killed, and when he kills it. Well, I mean, yeah. you'll see. But that when he when it, his it wife triggers was killed, him and, as almost as if it is some kind of trigger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his a memory's literal and back. figurative trigger. <laughs> and at no point is he like, wait a minute, why did that speaker start playing a song? <laughs> but this is, once again, like, watching it the first time, I was like, okay, this movie just wants to get through the beats as quickly as possible with zero elegance. And watching it the second time, I'm like, the transparency of, and now she's finished her final line of dialogue, so the music yeah. is going to start playing randomly, and it's the same song that was playing, is, is chef's kiss for me. Yeah, so at this point, it, it triggers him. He has a flashback to his wife being murdered. He realizes that his wife's been murdered by this guy. Uh, what is his name? Maximilian Axe or something? Uh, Martin uh, Axe. Martin Axe, I'm sorry. So he, I mean, uh, Maximilian he... Axe is an amazing name that they should have <laughs> yeah. gone with. Max so, Axe. The guy Max they have Axe. playing him is not cool enough to carry the name Maximilian Axe. He then, he then walks to, he just walks with no security to the parking garage takes, of course, a pickup truck, drives away, doesn't have to see security at all. Uh, he starts talking with Guy Pierce, who's like, hey, you can't leave. Like, he's talking to him through the nanites in his blood. You have speakerphone like, in your head. Yeah, basically. And yeah. he's this is, this is one of my favorite bits in the movie where, you know, they're doing a little bit of back and forth, and Vin's like, I just got to kill the guy who killed my wife. And Guy Pierce's like, no, you have to come back. He's like... I always come home, which was a little bit of banter he did with his wife. But for Guy Pierce, yeah. he's like, wait, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, he uses banter that he does with his wife, and Guy Pierce is like, uh, I'm not part of this. isn't an inside joke for me, dude. I don't listen to your podcast. Yeah, it's, um, it's almost <laughs> like he's reciting hacky action movie dialogue. A wink, a wink, a wink. <laughs> yeah. I, I wish Guy Pierce had been like, uh, wait. This is just like a temporary residence. Like it's not your home. Like we're yeah. gonna set you up with an apartment, I guess. Like this is. Do you really think you live here now? Because we got We've got fast turnaround. And Vin Diesel was like, "No, man, this is my home now. I made up my own. I peed on everything." And Guy Pearce is like, "Why did you do that?" But so I also love. We, the, I mean, sort of the self-aware brilliance. Guy Pearce plays this scene. You're like, he's not putting up enough of a fight. He's not getting freaked out enough about the fact that this guy's going rogue. Uh, because and, the, and they. He's playing this scene like he has a hard out and they only have two takes to get it done and he's just trying to do the bare minimum. <laughs> well, and, also, and the they're in in retrospect you know that they are they are putting on a little bit of an act because then the right. tech guy is like, "Oh my god, he's downloading a million things a minute into his computer brain." Right. In the way that people in worse movies are always st- stating out loud the thing they're amazed at that someone else right. is and doing. And the, the yeah. tech guy is even more apathetic. Like, he can't even find a take on his character. He is so dispassionate yeah. when he says, like, sir, there are five vans following him. Um, but but also, it, it, there's a great touch where Guy Pierce says, like, Garrison, what are you doing? And then he turns around, there's no response, and he goes to the tech guy, and he's like, is the mic on? And the guy's like, no. And he's like, Jesus, turn the mic on. And then he just does the line reading again. <laughs> <laughs> they should to, it's, to it's the Eric fact that this open is a, a little... channel. That's what it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I would say that this this tech guy is one of the things that rubbed me more so the wrong way in this movie. You know, once the twist and everything, because he is such a because for all the things in the movie that seem to be cliche for a purpose, he is just cliche. And there's yes. a bit about how he has a small penis that seems totally unnecessary. <laughs> Not only did he has a small like, penis, but he wants it enhanced he by wants Guy a robot Pierce. Penis. Yeah. He wants he, a nanite he's about to penis. Ask, he's about to ask to have it enhanced. And it was like, did we really like... Is this really worth the movie, the runtime? <laughs> I, I gotta <laughs> say, when they set up that joke, penis? I didn't like it. But when they pay it off, I kind of like it. Because Guy Pierce is so dismissive while still like you know like sort of like transmitting to the audience like he knows what this guy is secretly asking about but he like just has no time for it so i (laughs) kind of laughed at that well it's it's like when when you know your staff has some kind of bullshit request (laughs) and you're like well i want to make them say it out loud (laughs) (laughs) but but also i i would argue there's a reading of this film in which that character the tech guy is the ultimate villain because he is the world's most despicable person a shitty writer who is just (laughs) cast In his checks. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, he's he's the one who he's just doing a job and he doesn't care who gets hurt. Right. It just it just there was just this moment of like, 
okay, yeah, the nerdy character has a small penis. I get it. Like, nobody else in the movie is held up to that kind of casual ridicule. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. And considering there's a super cool tech guy later on who be, who helps uh-huh. the hero, it, like, just made it even more so, like, So oh, okay, you're this- offended on behalf of nerds, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. basically, yeah. Okay. Nerds, the people, and the candy. But, but story, what, continue. But one What's guy's an artist, and the other guy is just, like, a hack fucking spec screenwriter, you know? Yeah, yeah. I so mean, a spec, at this scene, point- a spec screenwriter's doing it out of passion. No, this guy's writing specs just to be sold. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he doesn't even like <laughs> them. So at this point, uh, a- as we've already addressed, it seems like Oh, so uh, you're saying he's shot- Max Landis. Okay, exactly. never mind. Yeah. Yeah, no, there there totally, go. then yep, I get yep, it. Yep, okay. Yep, yep, I didn't realize he was Max Landis. Now I hate him. Tiny penis. Guys, 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 guys. <laughs> we, we're, we're infuriating Stuart to, to unsustainable <laughs> levels by interrupting his plot uh, summary. So, so, so Stuart, he steals a plane, right? Well, yeah, he steals a plane. He, uh, it seems like he has the ability to download information and skills directly to his brain. He teaches himself how to fly on the fly. <laughs> oh, shit. He, tra- he, he tracks down uh, Martin Axe, uh, and he stages an ambush in a tunnel using a semi-truck filled with flour. I have to admit, this sequence I found really confusing. Uh, uh, what part about it? <laughs> I mean, just not not the purpose of it or anything, but just the like the actual geography. fight choreography. Yeah. The can spatial we, geography. I like. It we, was very hard for me to figure out who, where he was, and who was shooting what. And it was it was a it was a tough scene for me to to y- to figure y- out like moment by moment. Yes, yeah. I would like to talk a little bit about this in so much as like I think that the film looks good, like yeah. like it, like the vibe of it, like it looks good. But in terms of the action sequences, other than the final action sequence, which I actually liked quite a the bit, the final one I thought was really good. Yeah, um, it is. It does fall prey a lot to the problem of a lot of modern action sequences, where the fight choreography is not thought out particularly well. The they're trying to cut a lot to make it seem exciting, which makes it sort of confusing. Just about the spatial, like like this. The scene looks great because you're in this like tunnel with all this like flour around like snow and, and it's lit emergen- only by like road flares it's red yeah, lights yeah, it's and emergency flour. headlights yeah, yeah it looks yeah, yeah, great yeah, yeah. it's like uh it's like uh like a samurai movie with like blood falling on the snow um, yeah well this director the- by the i just want to say like his job before this like he he is uh, he has one tv credit one episode of television but otherwise he is the dr- video game director of cut scenes so okay. do with that and as you may. He comes from the same company as... Wait, wait, Dan, what, what, what can I do with that? Uh, you <laughs> he know, said do with it as I may. I don't even know where to begin with. He said what tell it to the Marines, <laughs> maybe? file it away, and then on some, uh, some holiday, uh, you know, like deep into the future, perhaps a birthday, you know, like you can sort of like pull it out, you know, ponder it for a moment, think about the time that's passed since we had this conversation, and then put it back into the old memory bank. <laughs> Oh, that's sweet. Okay, Griffin, what were we going to say? I will do that, Dan. Thank you. This guy comes from the same, he might have even been a co-founder of the same video game cutscene slash special effects house that the Deadpool guy came from and the Sonic the Hedgehog movie came from. Oh, so wow. they are like oh, okay. the new film brats <clears throat> taking over the industry, except yeah. instead of all having the same alma mater that they went to for film school, they all worked on the same video cutscenes together. Um, I do like, though, even though... I think I, I agree that the choreography is not great and it's a little incomprehensible. I like that Bloodshot has to function as like his own art director and his own like gaffer. Like he's setting up good lighting yeah. and like good yeah. atmos for his <laughs> fight scenes. And I like that I like that all the fight scenes in this movie look different. Yes. Like they're distinct yeah. different things. Like there is some thought being put into that. I, I think this movie has visual thought. Yeah. So he wipes his, he, he kills all these mercs, uh, he blows up a bunch of stuff, he manages Every to... Every time you think he's defeated the mercs, there's like three more that pop out of a car. That's, that was and one of the things I was like, how many guys are there? <laughs> and Martin, Martin Axe not only is terrified of being attacked, but he realizes that there's something up. And we, we learn that Martin Axe knows more about bloodshot than uh, he, he should, right? But also um, Martin Axe, chin stroke, in no way resembles the guy from the opening of the film. Does not seem like the same man who would wear like Bermuda shorts and flip flops and a big winter yeah. coat while dancing to Psycho Killer. He seems very timid yeah. and terrified. Yes. Now we should yeah. we should make it clear this is Martin X and not the character Martin X from the Guardians uh-huh. of the Galaxy. <laughs> yep. The um, so... that's a Marvel character, not a Valiant character. 
So, of course, Vin Diesel kills him anyway. He heads home. He meets up with the rest of the team at an airfield where they seem annoyed, but they bring him back anyway. Uh, they mentioned something about his nanites almost being out of juice or something. Uh, and this is when we get the twist, guys. Who wants to talk about the twist? Uh, I think I, mean, I guess I guess I will. Vinhead. Okay, you do. Okay, so <laughs> this is when we find out that this is this is just one of many missions that Bloodshot's been on. That he has had his memory erased and reset, given a new implanted memory with a new target each time. It's the same script that he's working off of, and that explains all of the cliches, guys. It was intentional. Oh, uh, it's like wild things. It's supposed to be dumb. <laughs> Now I want to <laughs> I want to take a moment here to address the this twist. Now uh-huh. I think you can make a case for like maybe why it makes sense and I will after this, but for the most part the problem with this twist is it makes a lot more sense as a critique of action movies than it does as like a thing that would happen in life. Because well, this is a cr- well, wait, Dan. So hold on. <laughs> wait, wait, what? If I can interrupt your it, it interrupt your criticism. Uh, you're right. In real life, if you were using a reanimated <laughs> Marine's corpse filled with nanobots, <laughs> you would probably not go to these elaborate lengths. You might even give it no personality. Although, as we later learn on, Guy Pierce says he's the perfect assassin for these moments because he's so passionate because he has a reason to do it. Yes. But I think you're right. If only, and I'll help you with this one thing. It means every time they reboot him, Guy Pierce has to give him the same tour of the facilities. And yeah, I think that yeah. would get old pretty fast. Well, and then they had to fix they had to fix that load bearing pillar each time. Yeah, yeah, so you're right. A, that here's pillar. The thing. I bet. I, here's the thing. I bet that's not even really a load bearing pillar. That's probably an elaborate like Universal Studios backlot tour thing where they're like, okay, and he's punching it and hit the button so that the ceiling drops just <laughs> enough so it looks like it okay. Was well, weakened. you've interrupted me for enough. Uh, uh, as, <laughs> as Jesse would say, shut your pie hole. I just want to say, like, it makes sense in the sense like you're if you're subverting the idea of a revenge movie like this is great but in reality it's kind of like okay well why not just like reanimate a dude who doesn't care if he's killing a bunch of people and just have that <laughs> dude kill a bunch of people without going through this elaborate charade every time so this and- is my counterpoint it, it makes no sense in a technical real world level, but yes. you kind of have to accept the movie on like a Paul Verhoeven level, which is yes. because it's even underlined in the dialogue about like explaining to Outlander guy that he's better because he's more passionate because he has a backstory, like essentially saying this guy gets to be the lead of the movie and you don't because he has some weird charisma. He is emotionally accessible. <laughs> and also the yeah. audience is given a reason to root for him. Like he can't. Um, I think the movie works as like a meta commentary on movie stardom and like what you need to do to make an audience care about an action movie. (laughs) There is a throwaway line too, and we have no reason to necessarily believe it because it's from Guy Pearce, our unreliable narrator. But there's a throwaway line about how like he's the one guy they were able to make this work with. And so if that's true, then you can make an argument, okay, like they have to go through this charade because real life Vin Diesel, uh, whatever his fucking name is in this movie, has Ray Garrison has like a moral sense. So they need to like give him a, a motivation. Much well, like say, movie stars a- have some it factor that you can't manufacture. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can't build yeah. it in a lab. You can you can harness it. You can develop it further. But you either got it or you don't, kid. Well, as as we know, as we learned, Guy Pierce is eliminating people he used to work with yes. who are now business competitors of his. And so if it was someone like Dalton he was sending out, then Martin Axe could be like, hey, Dalton, I'll pay you twice what Guy Pierce is paying you, and then he'd just switch. But if this, if the killer, the, if the assassin thinks that Martin Axe killed his wife, nothing's going to stop him. So you need to – that's why they want those fake memories. Well, he is – you he is a get- soldier, so I feel like you could give him a simpler lie where you're just like, oh, this is a bad guy who uh, needs to be taken out. Are you, are you implying that our soldiers are not intelligent enough to see through lies? Because I would say I'm implying soldiers that, I know uh, that, are that very intelligent people. in the people. military are uh, <laughs> actively uh, uh, encouraged to follow the chain of, a, of command well, without asking here's questions. The- but here's the thing. Then Guy Pierce has to pretend he's in the military, which he could do, which would be yes. a different type of twist. It's a simpler but, lie is all I'm saying. But I'll say that Vin Diesel, then he's got to buy insignia and uniforms. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. Okay. And then, then he's up against that foul, <laughs> that money stolen, the, the idea of stolen valor. But Vin Diesel, because usually military people only take orders from 
higher ups in the military. It's not like if you went up to a soldier and were like, "Hey, do this for me," they'd be like, "I gotta follow I, orders." I, okay, yeah, boss. Yeah, I know it's not Elliot. Like, it's not I like know this Elliot, is the but game or surely something. the man yeah. who has engineered all this could not pretend to be part of the military. That is a bridge too far, <laughs> sir. I it's, mean, that's then, then you get a thing like in the game where the guy is that guy is talking to him, and then he sees the guy later on a commercial for medicine, and it's oh, like yeah. maybe they maybe they shouldn't have hired an actor who does commercials. Sure. <laughs> I maybe also they should have hired a guy who really works on the stage. Mostly. I mean, ultimately, isn't that part of the game though, Elliot? Oh yeah, it is. I mean, I guess it's an intricate game. Yeah. It's also like it has to be emotional and personal for him because he has to think that he is betraying orders to do, quote unquote, the mm. right thing. Like he has I to see, be yeah. motivated by a self-righteousness. I also love that Guy Pierce's big evil plan is essentially I want to fire everyone else who helped develop this script <laughs> so I can be the only one who gets residuals, you know? Like, that's yeah. his big plan yeah. is, like, we're going to sell it, and I'm going to make a ton of money, and the ends will justify the mean. I, I can be the only one with credit on this thing. So in a, in a weird way, uh, if we're mapping the Valiant universe onto it, it's almost like Jim Shooter, one of the founders of Valiant, mm-hmm. former Marvel editor-in-chief, is like, okay, I got to kill Bob Layton and David Michelin, all these other guys who worked with me on Valiant Properties, so that I can be the only cre- – which is not really a Phil Shooter thing to do. It's kind of more of a Stan Lee thing to yep. do in a way. <laughs> Guy but, Pierce uh, is kind of playing Stan <clears throat> Lee in this way, but it's a lot of those like yeah. comic book universes uh, – not the universes, but the actual like stories of the publishers themselves where it's like all the grunt work goes up to the top and then everyone gets thrown out and they're like, yeah, I just one day thought of Spider-Man single-handedly. Mm-hmm. Oh wow! Yeah, there's so, this movie's so deep. Uh, yeah, so we tell us we, more we about cut what back to we cut back to Vin Diesel lying on a table, a man apart. Vin Diesel lying there. Uh, Dalton explains everything that's going on because he resents Vin Diesel because he's uh, not a movie star. Harding he doesn't planning, have it. Yeah, mm-hmm. Harding is planning on selling the technology. He just has one final uh, guy that he needs to kill. Uh, Barris, Barris was his his final uh, mm-hmm. partner who Chuck now needs Barris to be eliminated. Has Chuck to be Barris. Killed. Um, so at this point, they go through the whole routine again. We see bits of the routine, and we can see how uh, it's fraying at the edges a little bit. And it's like and a how... mundane day at the office for everyone. Like now that it's been <laughs> yeah. exposed, it's like his whole emotional backstory can be covered in a really, really rote montage. He, uh, at this point, we are introduced to Barris, who has an army of goons, because everybody seems to be able to hire an army of goons, uh, and he has his own tech guy, played by New Girl's Lamorne Morris, with a English accent? Is that mm-hmm. his real accent? No, absolutely no, not. No, no. Absolutely not. I think he's okay, a Chicago I guy, say. I think. No, it's a, that's a pretty heavy Chicago accent. <laughs> he's got a lot of... Here we are, we're in the Windy City, and we're going to have some of that deep dish pizza. Oh, and, go know, balls. Put a lot on my hot dogs, mate. <laughs> I would say he's playing this role with a lot of verve. I don't think that the jokes that are given to him are particularly good, but he's doing his, his, his level best to like give everything he can to this. Oh, oh no, he's he's very admirable in the in the amount of enthusiasm he's giving, especially but you know, he gets to play himself, a local Chicagoan with that famous <laughs> Chicago accent. It's the second city love, but you know, we're the first city in the hearts of our neighbors. Uh I will also say I, I auditioned for and actively pursued this role. Uh and none of that stuff was in the script. It was oh, yeah. very lacking in any sort of characterization. So it really feels like he threw on a lot of choices that I think largely mm-hmm. work to try to define this yeah. guy's personality in yeah. some way. So was that true when you're trying to get that role? Oh, so badly you have no idea. Yes, <laughs> yes. A full court effort, multiple yeah. tapes. I made a direct plea. Like I, I sent like a yeah. video testimonial in addition to you my You offered audition. to have your memory wiped and go <laughs> on a revenge spree. I said, do what you want with my body. I will anonymously <laughs> donate it to you. I will imagine that I must give the best performance of my life in order to avenge my wife. If you yes. put me. <laughs> <laughs> Did the, you do an English accent for the tape? I didn't know because that wasn't in the script. It was just like uh. there was none of that. It, it was, uh, I, I think he pretty much, like the dialogue is pretty much the same, but it mm-hmm. feels like none of that, none of his character choices were in the breakdown. I um, yeah. So I think he did a pretty creative job with this role. Yeah. yeah I, and uh, Stuart, did you mention that, that uh, the swimmer has started getting upset 
that yeah so she's in. she obviously is not comfortable with what they're putting uh bloodshot through and she is <laughs> getting upset with uh the whole situation but uh harding is like this is just one last time then we can sell it and we're done she's stuck so, on like season six of a shitty tv show and she's like i'm <laughs> yeah. tired of playing this same part over and over again yeah she's um oh, what's her name from uh fresh off the boat Oh, she's Constance a, Wu. Yes, exactly. Constance yeah. Wu, which is a show I like, but she's the one where they're like, "Good news, we got another bloodshot mission." She's like, "Oh fuck, I gotta, do, I gotta do the bloodshot thing again." Oh man, I have like <laughs> offers. <laughs> so we now, uh, so Bloodshot shows up to Barris's compound, and we have an action sequence that is mainly through like what, like uh, heat based sec- mm-hmm. security cameras of yes. him uh like killing his way through goons because the Bear nanites Springs make is- him really hot in it, yep. in every sense of that word uh but also yeah. enough that he glows his red chest glows much like the grinch learning to love christmas or i would say much like iron man the first character in a different much more successful cinematic universe of comic book characters almost as if they're trying to fool us at times into thinking we're watching an iron man movie <laughs> Uh, so, <clears throat> so he fights his way through there. Uh, we find out that Barris's tech guy, uh, what's his name? Wally, Wendell, something, Wiggins. 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 Wiggins actually has a portable EMP device that they have to charge up so they can take out Bloodshot. And Wiggins uh, is a is a legendary techie guy. The, the yeah. techie guy that works for Guy Pierce is like, Wiggins, he's the king. Uh, I use some of his code for Bloodshot. And yeah, Wiggins so is, he, is dithering around in a way that initially you think is just because he's like uh, going to be a, an annoying comic relief character, but he has his reasons for taking his time with this EMP. He has his raisins? He has, he has his I raisins, yeah. clearly said <laughs> raisins, Elliot. And they're but. golden. They're golden. I wrote here my notes. I wrote, uh, Guy Pierce is the hack filmmaker who has indie posters on his wall. Uh, yep. Wiggins is the indie filmmaker trying to sneak through the studio system, but he's too esoteric to make something successful. Uh, and yeah. I, in my notes, it just says Wiggins, Iro, wisecracker. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Bloodshot fights his way through there. He kills Barris, and you think that he is man to avoid the EMP, but somebody who we later learn is Wiggins, triggers it anyway, taking out all the power and disrupting uh, disrupting Harding's plan and his surveillance and control over Bloodshot. This the is, this end of the movie. End of movie. Oh, this, there's okay. a moment here where it feels like the movie is trying a little too hard to, to call it to call out cliche things where the tech guy's like, he's got an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse. That'll shut off all the electricity. And Guy Pearce is like, I know what an EMP is. <laughs> <laughs> So, of course, uh, Wiggins wakes uh, Bloodshot up using some, uh, like, a car battery. Uh, And they basically explain at this point, like, they talk a little bit about his powers, and they're like, oh, wow, now you're free of their control. We can do whatever we want. And he's like, well, what I want is to find my wife and kill this guy. And we're like, okay, that makes sense. But he's not completely free of their control in some sort of, like, vague way. I mean, like, like, they can come back in and, like, hijack him. And this this is one of the moments... Where I was a little confused plotting wise, it felt like maybe something got cut out, maybe the script got changed. Because we leave Wiggins in such a way where you think, like, okay, well, he's going to continue to work uh, for Vin Diesel on this problem of like totally liberating Vin Diesel from their control. But then the next time we see him, spoiler, like the swimmer is like, like kind of hijacking him. And taking him off mm-hmm. so the two of them can work together to help Vin Diesel. I'm like, wait, hold on. Like, in between times, like, what was Wiggins doing? Like, was he trying to help? Was he just, like, ignoring him? Like, I don't get I'm, what was I'm, going I'm, on He said he was, we, like, trying to hack the, the nanite sample that that he gave him. Yeah, well, they we said that like, at the end of the scene, but then we don't see any of that. Like, he just kind of disappears next, from the movie. The next time we see Wiggins, he also has, like, his own personal bodyguards. Which yeah. confuses yeah. me. Yes. I was so confused because I was like, wait a minute. So is he rich? Like, I don't understand. I don't know what w- well, Wiggins was say- working for Barris and he refers to himself as an indentured servant. But then yeah. like, I, I, but he also, he writes open source code. So like, is he, 
a wealthy tech guy or is he like an anarchist tech guy who doesn't make money but is like a, ma- a crazy master? You know? Well, there's, yeah. there's a couple. Look, there are a lot of layers to Wiggins. It's a multifaceted okay. character. Okay. <laughs> if I, I can, can see why you wanted to play the character so badly. So badly. <laughs> I mean, first of all, they explain that he is a sort of uh, gone to seed former child prodigy, which is the number one thing I audition for. Whenever I see that in a log line, I think I have. <laughs> yeah, yeah a like chance. a Billy Quiz Boy type yeah, thing. Yeah, just broken child <laughs> genius. Uh, 10 years later is is kind of my wheelhouse. But so yes, he was sort of this child prodigy. I think they show a newspaper clipping that he won some sort of coding award in like elementary <laughs> school. But I think, yes, he does open source because he's a fucking artist, Elliot, okay? Yeah. He's not about yeah, working like, for the man. He's got so stuck, his- he's stuck in this fucking shitty contract. He got sold a false bill of goods. <laughs> he's stuck on a first look deal with this shitty fucking guy. <laughs> and to continue the analogy, he lets Vin Diesel go because he's still in the seduction period of like, he has gotten access to a coffee meeting with a major movie star who he's trying to convince to sign on so that he could get financing for his project. Like he's got a vague idea of like, this is how I could use you and it would be for good, but I don't totally have my shit together enough to get you to sign on for this yet. I think the metaphor works perfectly if it's in terms of filmmaking. It does not make sense in terms of the immediate story. That the <laughs> Absolutely <is> not. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. I will like, concede he's that. Like, he's like, bloodshot, I'm going to work on this problem for you. I'll see you, I guess, when I get around to it. Do you want status updates? Vin Diesel, no, that's okay. I got some <laughs> stuff to do. All right. Do you want my phone number? Nah, that's, I'll find you. It's and, okay. I got and Vin Diesel, in my head. And Vin Diesel does have stuff to do because yeah. he tra- he goes to London. <laughs> he tracks down his wife, Gina's flat. Mm. Mm-hmm. And uh, he knocks on the door and they, you know, they have a reunion. But then we find out she's actually remarried. They're not together anymore. She has a child and it's been five years since she last saw him. Not only what? that, like they broke up long before he then was taken by Guy Pierce. Yeah. Like not yeah. only has she moved on, but his memory uh-huh. of them being together up until the end is like far, far in the past. It's, um, I mean, it, that memory, I would go as far as to say what they're telling us is all of that memory is false. Yes. And yeah. This is literally, they took his last regu- serious girlfriend and uh-huh. just slapped her face and name onto the idea of a wife. And who knows how, and she makes it very clear like this, it wasn't like, oh, this, you know, uh, there was something happened and it got in her way. Like she did not want to be in a relationship with no. him anymore. Maybe they saw. Well, she season. suggested she wanted him to stay and not leave. I mean, that indicates that she did like him. Yes. But she also like reacts him, with then... a little fear of him when he comes. Yeah, he's on. scary. Sure. If, if Vin Diesel showed up on your doorstep, even if no, you're a I know, fan but is, like, I afraid. do think that it implies because <laughs> like, she she realized reaction, she could just lose her, leave her current life behind to leave with Vin Diesel. Her reaction implies to me that they not only broke up, but it was a bad breakup. And she's like, she is not unhappy to see him in the same way that you might not be unhappy to see someone that enough time has passed that you're cool with them again. And like, it's like nice for old time's sake. But she seems a little nervous in a way that suggests that things ended very badly. Yes, and here there's something very realistic in this scene, which is that her young daughter will not stop trying to get her attention and make her come into the house while this hulking man is standing right. there upsetting her. And so it's like, I, look, I'm living that life right now, people. It's very hard to – like, you could tell a kid, I'm talking to my ex, and he's a super marine assassin, and so I'm a little afraid of why he's here. The kid does not care. They just want to come and show you their new Paw Patrol thing. I, I fully love this scene because I feel like this, the real Gina that we're seeing for the first time is the only character who is not in the movie Bloodshot. It's just like, <laughs> yeah, I just have a yeah. day to do. And and yeah, the arc of the scene is like, that was a bad breakup, but I've moved on. I don't hold it against him anymore. My life turned out okay. He shows up on her doorstep. She's like, oh, this is like funny and weird. I guess you're in the neighborhood. We'll catch up for a couple minutes. Then she starts to become scared that he's a psycho and then she goes all the way around to feeling actually bad for him where you can tell by the end of the scene she's like is he having like a psychotic break like he's not making any sense and my note i wrote here is love that the gina scene is fully embarrassing just a complete
completely <laughs> earnest face plant. Like there is a yeah. level of vulnerability to how much Vin is failing in this scene. And and to the point also where Vin Diesel, famously deep voiced man, his voice cracks a couple times in this scene where he goes like, when was the last time you saw me? And she goes, five years. And he goes, five years? And he sounds like <laughs> Cookie Monster. Like it's he's doing both like a falsetto vibrato. But um, it, it is this thing where he just like cannot fathom that even though everyone was lying to him, he assumed that she must have been waiting out there for him in his life. And he's just being well, told also, also, like he was forced to method act like he was using a backstory of a woman to map onto the <laughs> scenes that he was playing on a day to day basis. Yeah. There's yeah. there's something about like you're saying that every other situation it's like oh I can tough guy my way through this but right. there is no way uh, uh, aside from becoming a monster and doing something monstrous there's no way to tough your way out of like going to visit someone you think you're in a relationship with and then being like no uh, this is not happening <laughs> and so he's not just deal like he's not just dealing with the fact that oh all of my memories are different and I don't have a life it's also like yeah embarrassment like oh this is awkward I don't even know now I feel like a like a jerk and yeah. she feels bad for me and I don't want yeah. that like I want her to think I'm cool like yeah. I'm yeah. a cool guy I'm a bloodshot and, <laughs> and I'm assuming he's he's thinking all that stuff he's thinking like why did that? Spe why did this specific conditioning work so well on me? What does that say about my personality? So <laughs> yeah. while he's having these thoughts, he then gets attacked by Tibbs and Dalton, and who are on the such, hunt. This must be such a relief for him to be like, "Oh, thank goodness, I don't have oh, to I be." Can a I fool can just battle in front of my extraordinary. Yeah, I could just battle these guys. This is what I can do. Like I, that's something I wish they had shown a little bit more of him being like, "Oh, thank God, I, I can get into a fight now." Yeah, rather yeah. than I, having to deal with these emotions. I don't <laughs> have to find an out for this conversation anymore. I don't have to pretend like I have to be somewhere. <laughs> He doesn't have to go, vert, vert. Oh, that was my phone. Hold on. Uh, <laughs> a new girlfriend? Oh, yeah, I'll come have sex with you. I gotta go. Uh, so this is basically a chase sequence where Bloodshot is running away. Dalton is firing these, like, EMP bullets at him that, like, sterilize his nanites or something. Mm -hmm. uh, while Tibbs is, like, doing all kinds of hot dog stunts on his fucking motorbike. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, uh, and and uh, there's some really great comic relief policemen in a car. That is great. Where they, he like kicks the car, and there's like three slow motion shots of these two cops who, despite being in London, are eating American style donuts and coffee. <laughs> are are fucking going, like Whoa. Keystone cops? Yeah. yeah. But no, you like yeah. The car is like <laughs> sort of like at half speed spinning around. And Vin is backing away, using the car as a like shield as it rotates. It's pretty yeah, great. Yeah, and it keeps cutting to them going, "What? No!" I just watched the begin the first half of Onward last night, and like these cops could have been in Onward. Oh yeah, like, that's, that's how suddenly cartoonish they are. Yeah, I I kind of wanted a scene with these two cops telling their like friends and family after like the night after this uh, this situation what they saw and what just <laughs> happened. But um, so uh, at the you know the fight continues. Dalton's robot legs get knocked off. It looks like Vin's got him, and then Tibbs drives up and stabs him in the, in the back with a jackknife, which, which I guess logs him onto the internet. And then they shut him down remotely. Yeah, and he which... has like three seconds to pull this knife out, and I'm like, in my, I'm just like yelling, like Vin, Vin. When they like jab you with a thing, you pull it out because you gotta He's know that jacked. they're trying to hijack him into the Matrix. But like, but if it, if there's like one thing I know about it. Vin Diesel, it's that he never pulls out. No one has ever <laughs> believed in the pull out oh, method less than Vin Diesel. <laughs> no, he's he's he never enters unless he's invited. <laughs> But he never pulls yeah. out. I want to make this very clear. Uh, okay. Okay. The, I mean, also, like, just logistically, I don't think he can get his arms all the way around to his back. He's just <laughs> yes. too muscly. That is also well, just true. Use those, well, he use just those nanites to extend his arms a little bit. Yeah. Like, come on. Or tell the nanites awesome. to push that thing out. Okay, so now KT goes on her own mission. She uh, she waits outside for Wiggins to leave his hotel with his security detail. She uses her uh, her special breathing abilities to blow poison smoke into people's faces, but she herself is unaffected by that smoke because, as we've addressed, she has special breathing abilities because of her cyborg lungs. She then beats up some dudes with one of those rods and then uh, captures Wiggins, although... At when she returns to Harding, she says, Wiggins got away. What? Hold hmm. on. Now, what if, now here's, guys, what if 
she got mistaken, and she went while she was capturing this Wiggins. She thought the mission was to go kill Wiley Wiggins, oh, start no. dazed and confused, and and but he got away. I mean, like, you're, so it's what you're describing think, now, Elliot, isn't an action film; it's a tragedy. I I, <laughs> I cannot even even for laughs on a podcast imagine what would happen if we were to lose Wiley Wiggins, <laughs> Austin I'm film sorry. scene staple. I well, I mean, luckily, I he's far too wily to be <laughs> captured yes. by the lady. No, the wiliest yeah, of all of course, Wiggins. While E. Wiggins, he was able to use his Acme devices to get away. <laughs> so while while KT is deceiving them, Harding has a chat with Bloodshot in the, what, neural realm, which is basically one of those, like, inevitable, like, uh, you know, is it worth fighting, yada, yada. You, you should just do this because what, what is life anyway? Well, he cetera, essentially gives Bloodshot a series of notes. He gives him a round of notes. He's like, can I just give you <laughs> just a quick pass really, on some really of the really stuff? Really going with this analogy, doing. keeping yeah. the analogy going. I love it. But, then, love the but then it even gets down to, he goes like, I made you the best version of yourself. And, and Bloodshot says, your ve- best version of me. And he's like, look, I made you sad. I killed a fake girlfriend. Like, but I got you there. And he's essentially the abusive director saying, like, look, <laughs> if I got the performance out of you, isn't that, like, what you yeah. wanted at the end of the day? Yeah, Shelley Duvall. Right. It was, it, was, it, was, it was hard for me to pay attention to this since I was still blown away from the five or six minutes they spent building the fake Italy that they're in. <laughs> yeah, they did a real watching computer graphics serenity unfold. where the yeah. <laughs> graphics just sort of you know, came out. You don't need this much Italy for this conversation they're having. Yeah. Like, we don't need the mountains. <laughs> so now that KT has lied and said that Wiggins is on the run, he's in the wind, uh, they decide to stop draining the nanites out of him. And instead, they're, they got to reboot Bloodshot and they have to map Wiggins' face back on the murderer of his wife. KT interrupts the sim uh, while we find out that Wiggins, who is in the wind, is actually in a, uh, a van underneath the building, and he, start, he hacks into the Bloodshot system, waking up Bloodshot. Bloodshot wakes up. Uh, KT uh, uses her breathing ability again to sneak around, uh, sneak around Guy Pierce. She then uses her breathing ability to blow up the server system. I mean, I don't know that she used her breathing ability for that. She just, she just it's walked in just and blew a grenade. it up. Uh, I don't think you could have done it with your human life. Right. But also, she, her, she blows it up with similarly bloodshot esque, very moody red lighting uh, explosives because she uh-huh. now needs to prove that she also can be an action star. She now, also here, now blows was, it up with was... great trust that the 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 windows behind her are not going to burst, <laughs> yes. spraying yeah. glass into that, her. That she can breathe those glass, explosion-proof though. glass. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and the belief that those servers aren't one hundred percent necessary to the functioning <laughs> of these nanites. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Now, uh, this is around the point when I started realizing that this movie is basically Tootsie as an action movie, when uh-huh. both okay. are about somebody who's forced to really transform themselves and mm. become a new person, not because it's best really for them, but because the system around them has decreed it that that's the only way they're going to survive in the mode that is you know, most comfortable with them, the only way they can survive. And that, again, there's a woman assisting who doesn't really get her own full life or story, but is still necessary to making uh, Bloodshot, or as I call him, Tootsie, uh, you know, <laughs> successful until he can turn the tables and reveal himself again. Well, because, look, she's trying to take control of her narrative again. She's trying to restart her career on her own terms, and she's the one who proactively reaches out to Wiggins. And it's mm-hmm. like, we should be united in this, figuring out how to bypass the studio system. So you're saying she is Elizabeth Banks yes. creating her own projects. Yes. So that she's more than just like an actress who at some point will have to play moms, even though she is only 10 years older than the kid playing her child. Right. And, yeah. and so she's going she's gonna to make her own stuff. I see. I get that. That makes sense. Yeah. So... Now Dalton uh, puts on an exosuit because those robot legs alone aren't going to kill Bloodshot. So he puts on this exosuit that has two extra arms, and then he gets in a fight with Bloodshot. Uh, this is a pretty cool fight. Like I like that the the exosuit arms basically are just a little bit longer, so it gives him some reach. <laughs> no, it looks like he's wearing like the arms from that scene in Nightmare on Elm Street where Freddy just extends his arms really silly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. scrapes the, the fences. I, yeah, it's trying to... Psychological warfare right there. Yeah, I'm going to say, like, I, I'm i not going to pretend I didn't like the movie up until this point, but I also, when he put on these extra long robot arms, I'm like, okay, well, this is the movie I really wanted to 100%. see. 
one hundred percent. Um, so I, as as I believe, I would assume the only person here who has watched all these special features on the digital release of Bloodshot. <laughs> I think that's a fair. That's a fair uh, assumption. And yeah. this this goes back to the point of the earlier action sequences not being uh, terribly exciting, even if the movie itself is kind of stylish overall. Uh, this movie had a budget of like forty million dollars, which is very yeah. very budget for something that is trying to uh, kickstart a cinematic universe based on comic books. Um, but there is an alternate ending with a, a director's intro that is this final battle, except it just happens uh, without any CGI in the uh, swimming pool that Isa Gonzalez does her dances in. Uh, and then he just drowns him to oh, death. Oh, okay. And uh, they said that they that was the ending in the script with the budget they had, and they screened it for the studio, and they were like, this is the most anticlimactic thing of all time <laughs> oh <laughs> shit so this entire final action sequence is like the one reshoot in the movie that is them saying like we'll give you a couple extra million dollars make your video game cutscene. like we know you can do that do your insane yeah. comic book fight yeah. scene and it's why it's the only fight scene in this that is actually pretty exciting i mean that explains why they spent a certain a good amount of time setting up that swimming pool yes because otherwise yeah. there's yeah. no reason for her to be a swimmer no reason for her power to be special breathing no reason for them to have a pool swimming like, pool yeah. is supposed to be the Chekhov's gun that then Vin Diesel transfers so many nanites to this guy that he becomes heavy and drowns in the pool <laughs> it is, oh, it is wow. pretty terrible, terrible alternate fight yeah yeah and, and, I mean, and he's like I wish I had the lung breathing power instead right <laughs> It's the uh, because this scene is a really fun like creative action scene. Yeah, and the it, only the only they, issue I had with it was that they seem to keep forgetting that Vin Diesel has nanites in his body and can come back from anything because they're just dropping him down elevator shafts and then they're surprised when he comes back and it's like, yeah, dudes, he's full yeah. of nanites. I don't know what to tell you. But then also yeah, this is the, when he like goes turbo and finally transforms into something that vaguely resembles the comic book character. Like he gets his sort of yeah. kabuki yeah. bloodshot get up where he's pale white and his eyes are red. The thing about this exosuit is it reminded me of the movie Elysium if the movie Elysium was cool and yep. had longer arms for the exosuit. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so the the they get in this big fight. It's crazy. They end up on these like giant elevators. Uh, Tibbs uh, joins in in the fight, and you're like, whoa, dude, you don't even have an exosuit. And, of course, uh, Dalton ends up letting Tibbs die, and he thinks he's got Bloodshot, but, of course, Bloodshot kills uh, Dalton, and he falls all the way to the bottom, and you're like, oh, man, he's almost dead. And then, uh, nope, he's not dead, and he interrupts uh, Harding, who, her, yeah, what's his name? Harding, Harkness, whatever, Harding. who is trying to escape. Uh, he throws a robot arm through his car, <laughs> Uh, and Harding shoots uh, shoots Bloodshot with a grenade, which uh, maxes out his, depletes his nanites, I guess, because using the nanites a lot, his nanite percentage goes down like 2% or but something. And you're like, he what sees the this. Fuck? Guy Pierce has a readout on his rubbit arm, and it says nanite mm -hmm. levels depleted at a certain point. And that is one of those lines, even if it's not spoken out loud, if your movie can somehow get to nanite levels depleted as three <laughs> words in a row, you have me. <laughs> it's so great because uh, Lamorne Morris Wiggins is, is, wa is watching the nanites reducing at his computer screen. And as soon as they hit zero, all of his monitors turn off. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was one of the stranger things earlier, too, when he sets off the EMP. His, his Wiggins monitors don't turn off. They just say no feed. So I guess maybe his stuff was shielded. I don't know, but it just seems yeah. very funny that it like shuts off everything and then, but his, his stuff is fine. He's got some hand crank computers. Yeah. But I also, <laughs> he has, he has a horse walking in a giant wheel and that's what powers yeah, his computers. I mean, he yeah. is the one guy who knew that this was coming. I don't know. That's yeah. fair. That's very yeah. fair. So but, he has a But Harding is also the making like the argument of like, well, you can't kill me. I'm the only person who understands how to use you. Like I made you, you're, you're like inherently tied to me. And what I wrote down here was it's literally about th the three POC characters fighting for autonomy and control of their narrative and the conviction conventional white man's fight against irrelevance and then my next note is yep. i love this movie i can't wait to watch it a third time <laughs> uh so yeah so uh, at this point his nanites are depleted uh guy pierce shoots another uh grenade at him 
the last bit of nanites are used to strip the casing off the grenade. Guy Pierce walks up and he's like, the nanites are gone. It's just you. And then, uh, of course, Vin Diesel reveals. I mean, at that point, you're like, yeah, he's just Vin Diesel. You're yeah. totally dead, dude. So <laughs> he holds out in his hand that he's got the uh, grenade, which he drops on the ground and it explodes, killing Guy Pierce and theoretically killing uh, Vin Diesel. Finally, he can rest. His, his, his hard work is over. He knows for the first time, much like Murphy realizing he is Murphy and not RoboCop. Mm -hmm. He realizes for the first time just who he is inside. His true heart is I enough mean, that's, to be a hero. That is something that, that I feel like it's weakened slightly by the fact that the audience has no idea who he oh, is. Oh, no. We so, haven't met Ray Garrison. We don't know him at all. <laughs> no. All we know is that he has an ex-girlfriend that he still has feelings for. And otherwise, I don't know if he was really in the military. I yeah. guess so. When he says, I said I'd always come home. And she was like, but I wanted to stay at home. He could have been a traveling salesman. I don't know. Like, yeah. it's maybe, maybe yeah, I suppose as opposed he could have been to the actor. colorful character Murphy was before he became RoboCop. <laughs> no, but uh, but you see Murphy's fam. You know what yeah. Murphy's actual family is. Yeah, sure. you know he can do like the gun spinning trick. pistols around. Exactly. I mean, I think, yeah. and I think that's one of Verhoeven's jokes is that Murphy has more personality as a robot yes. than he did as a as a human yeah. being. But like you know, when he's like, "I know who I am now," the audience is like, "Great, are we gonna? Can I find out? <laughs> is that because I know your name? Is your name really Ray? I think it is. Or is that a nickname? Like I don't I don't know." So we, uh, of course, the next thing we know, Bloodshot is waking up from a new fresh injection of nanites. They're hanging out in a trailer somewhere along Pacific Coast Highway 1, I bet, and uh, which is, is along the South African coast. Wiggins is dressed so stylish. He's gone Hollywood. He sold his first script. That he's now on the <laughs> other side. He's new money. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't yeah. quite understand the logic of this, where it's just like, okay, well, we blew up the bad guys, so now I guess I'm rich, but yeah. whatever. Well, that's the thing. He he secretly has been running the exact same con oh. that Harding has been doing, and Harding was his last rival in the game, right? Yeah. Could now be. he controls Bloodshot. But, uh, but although he's is Bloodshot an controlled? We don't know. <laughs> yeah. That's what he's been telling people anyway. But yeah. then... Uh, they uh, now they're all. It's really funny because Vin and then Vin Diesel tells KT, "It's like now we get to choose our own destinies." And they all drive off together. And I'm like, "So why are you guys a team now? Yeah, like yeah. there's nothing Hell, holding yeah, you together except that that you were all part of this. Thing. But like, why? What is keeping them together? What are things but they can it's do also together? Perfect. Yeah, what what can they do together, Elliot? Um, well, she can breathe shit while he's punching people, and Wiggins codes sounds like a perfect trio to me. No, I mean, yeah. it, in terms of powers, yes, they, it, it meshes perfectly. So complimentary. Uh, but it's like, but Wiggins is like, hey, I've known you for a couple of days, and you tried to kill me for a little bit. And KT is like, hey, I've seen you be used over and over again as a robo-assassin. I guess we're a family now? Yeah. And I, I, guess Vin Diesel, I guess everything with Vin Diesel is about family. Every Vin Diesel like, movie is so. about yeah. family. And also Fast and Furious, Bloodshot, Olive Garden, it's all about family for him. And Vin Diesel also, uh, or not Vin Diesel, but the movie at large, including Vin Diesel, uh, it plays the uh, the Total Recall card, which is you have this uh -huh. shot of them driving into the sunset, and then they literally lampshade it and say, driving off into the sunset, are we sure this isn't a simu? And it cuts off Lation and goes to yeah. credits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's which, like, uh, yeah, it's the spinning top at the end of Inception. Yeah, and I, yeah well, and the, the, the end scene is so perfect that it does, you, it is impossible not to have that thought. Like, is this just another level of manipulation? And then the movie, as you say, lampshades it. And, like, I, I like how kind of lightly they treat it, but also the more I think about it, like, the idea that maybe they were trying to start a valiant universe, like, it's much more ballsy that they end the movie this way because it suggests oh, yeah. that any possible sequels are all also just a fantasy that Bloodshot oh, is yeah. having. And it's all in it's all in the same elsewhere kid's head, ultimately. Yeah. All yeah. these movies. That's but that I was waiting for the uh, mid credit sequence where they're like, Sir, sir, uh, this killer on the loose. Don't worry, we'll stop him with the Harbinger project. <laughs> but then what you said makes sense that they don't have a scene like that. But yeah. they I was waiting for that mid credit sequence yeah, where they yeah, set yeah. up characters no one has heard of ever. Yeah, yeah, they're like, excuse me, Mr. Toyo Harada. We have inf <laughs> information about the hardcore project or whatever. Yeah, I mean, aside from the fact that the audience wouldn't recognize those names, it also just feels like, to your point, Dan, you know, and I, I think to this movie's credit, whether or not it was, uh, you know, intentional on the filmmakers' parts, few films have ever felt less conducive to building out a bunch of spinoffs. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. since since the movie it is like they tried to make a total recall universe yes. and they'd be like, like oh yeah yeah all that stuff was real all right. the stuff happened he went to mars and all that stuff you're like it's, what the it's, fuck it's totally... happens parallel to this what are you talking about <laughs> like i love yeah, that what, the movie I mean... is sort of such a failure at building out a cinematic universe that it becomes a perfect self-contained movie <laughs> it, it did such a bad job at it that if they were to say bloodshot 2 is coming out next summer we would all be like yes please yes yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, so okay. yeah, why don't we go into final judgments, guys? Yeah, this is where we say it's a whether it's a good bad movie, a bad bad movie, or a movie we kind of liked. But I think we all know that we enjoyed this movie. So I, I think I think there's a I think there's a continuum of enjoyment. I think we all kind of yes. liked it. I don't. I think that Griffin may be the only one who loves it. Correct. Entirely. And purely. I think I think it's the best movie you've ever covered on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I want I want to plant this flag now before there's some five years later John Wick Jack Reacher style reassessment from uh, the people not you guys but the people who have dismissed this movie out of hand. Here's another thing, another little nuance I like in this movie. There's this scene mm -hmm. where uh, uh, KT comes to Guy Pierce and is like, "I want out of my contract. Like I want to go on to uh, appear <laughs> in Marvel movies or whatever Constance Wu was trying to do instead." Um, and Guy Pierce tries to make the argument for why what they're doing is still like artistically valid. And um, uh, she's saying like he deserves to like be let go of this. He deserves to not be run through this simulation over and over again. And Guy Pierce really earnestly says what he deserves is a military funeral. Because I feel like <laughs> unlike a lot of movies where they try and fail to build up a sort of ideology that the villain thinks that he's the good guy, this is a movie in which the villain wants to get brownie points for being woke. Like he wants to pretend that he is actually the most considerate and empathetic and that he is doing this for a better reason and a greater cause and the ends justify the means. Um, not just that like, you know, ultimately this will pay out, but also like, you don't understand, I'm actually more considerate than you are. I recognize that he's a <laughs> fucking hero. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's the real ally in this situation. Yeah, he's the <laughs> ultimate ally. I mean, I will say like, I may overvalue this movie just because there's, there are a few things I like better than like a scrappy little uh, sci-fi action movie. Totally. Like, or a scrappy do. Or scrappy do. <laughs> Love him. <laughs> Most people say he ruined Scooby Doo. Not me. He perfected it. <laughs> no, but like it's it's a kind of like knowingly uh, B level genre movie that I am programmed to respond to anyway. But this is a fun yeah. version of that. Totally. Yeah. And I think like sort of the parallel to what you're saying, it's it's one of the reasons I for so long would always argue the value of these you know annual uh, January February Liam Neeson action film cuz i was mm -hmm. like these are the only movies that are disconnected from any fucking cinematic universe even the one series he has taken is clearly making it up as it goes along <laughs> and they're just mm -hmm. like so in control and like full ownership of what they are and not trying to be what they aren't and like living in the beautiful space of just like this is just like it's a 20 million dollar action movie that comes out in the winter and so rarely do we get a film like that that also is uh, a sci-fi film or you know has special effects or is based off intellectual property because the second yeah. those elements get involved they're like this has to be a four quadrant start of a larger franchise and it feels like this yeah. movie just backed away from all of that whether by design or whether by just sort of a lack of conviction at the studio level that this could <laughs> lead to any sequels it's like this movie is just so fully what it is and I would say I would say uh, that it's uh, the Liam Neeson parallel. Also, like how many other films are dealing with the things that the elderly have to face than Liam Neeson's movies or The Farewell? That's pretty much it. Yeah, it's like mm -hmm. last year if you wanted to see a movie about the elderly, it was just The Commuter or The Farewell. Yeah. That's right. all you can, that's, it really that's deals all you got. with like how many cuts an old man needs to get over a fence. <laughs> to yeah. look like it's to look make it look like he's jumping over a fence. Yeah, that's it. Sorry, yeah, I sorry. mean, so <laughs> many, so many. Uh, like, if I want an action fix. And it isn't going to be like a big, uh, like a big budget franchise movie. I have to go to like VOD Scott Adkins right. action movies. Yes. So this is yeah, this is pretty nice. The the movie this reminds me of the most now that you've pulled out Scott Adkins, Stuart, 
is uh, I think it's the fourth Universal Soldier movie, yeah, Universal yeah, Soldier yeah. Uh, Day of Reckoning, which is also yep. about uh, a sort of guy who is reprogrammed <laughs> over and over again <laughs> to think that he is acting out a sort of self-righteous mission, but is actually just like fulfilling everyone else's desires. <laughs> Welcome back to Fireside Chat on KMAX. With me in studio to take your calls is the dopest duo on the West Coast, Oliver Wong and Morgan Rhodes. Go ahead, caller. Hey, uh, I'm looking for a music podcast that's insightful and thoughtful, but like also helps me discover artists and albums that I've never heard of. Yeah, man. Sounds like you need to listen to Heat Rocks every week. Myself and I'm Morgan Rhodes and my co-host here, Oliver Wong, talk to influential guests about a canonical album that has changed their lives. Guests like Moby, Open Mike Eagle, talking about albums by Prince, Joni Mitchell, and so much more. Yo, what's that show called again? Heat Rocks, deep dives into hot records. Every Thursday on Maximum Fun. Hello, this is Amy Mann. And I'm Ted Leo. And we have a podcast called The Art of Process. We've been lucky enough over the past year to talk to some of our friends and acquaintances from across the creative spectrum to find out how they actually work. And so I have to write material that makes sense and makes people laugh. I also have to think about what I'm saying to people. If I kick your ass, I'll make you famous. The fight to get LGBTQ representation in the show. Mm -hmm. We weirdly don't know as many musicians as you would expect. I really just became a political speechwriter by accident, realizing that I have accidentally uh, pulled my pants down. <laughs> Listen and subscribe at MaximumFun.org or wherever you get your podcast. It's like if the guinea pig was complicit in helping the scientist. The Flophouse is sponsored in part by Squarespace. Aww. Hey, everyone. We're all at home. You know, well, not all of us. Some of us are forced to work, and uh, my hearts are with you if you're... Uh, one of them. I said hearts. My multiple hearts. Uh, uh, this ad read is going great. But if you're, if you are Dan, stuck at home. how did this home, turn into a solo ad read when we're all here? <laughs> but if you are stuck at home, maybe it's time to start your own website. You know, you can turn your cool idea into something we can all enjoy on the internet. Blog or publish content. Sell products and services of all kinds. And much, much more. Squarespace allows you to do this by giving you beautiful, customizable templates created by world-class designers. Everything is optimized for mobile right out of the box. People can look at it on their phones, their tablets, their whatchamacallit. It's a new way to buy domains and choose from over 200 extensions. Free and secure hosting. Hey, head to squarespace.com slash flop for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code FLOP to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Now, uh, Dan, I had a question. So I have a website idea, and I was mm -hmm. wondering if Squarespace could help me with it. You know, I, I thought you might have this question, <laughs> uh, and I think the answer is probably yes, but why don't you expound upon it at length? So the, the technology, I'm not just not sure if it's there yet. I was so inspired by this movie, I wanted to start a website called Brainspace, where mm -hmm. with Brainspace, we've got customizable templates so that you can change the memories fantasies and also vengeances of individual people maybe yourself okay. maybe someone else i was just so impressed in the movie at how easy it was to just go into vin diesel's memory and change what things looked like add a machete here change a guy's face to that and i want to mm -hmm. make that kind of thing available to people for a reasonable price so it's called brainspace.net brainspace.com of course was taken by my previous website where it was places to put your brain if you're not using it it's like a storage mm -hmm. space for your brain yeah. uh didn't go great how, how, yeah uh, how did they uh -huh. go a lot of people paid the deposit and then did not pay the, the fees for the monthly rate, mm -hmm. and we end up having to throw a lot of brains mm -hmm. out, you know, just in the garbage. <laughs> it's in the contract. Uh, but so brainspace.net, of course, would be like, hey, go into someone's brain and, like, would, I want things to be able to scale from, one, from dreams to memories. I want 24-hour uh, customer service and templates. Do you think they could help me set that up? Uh, I think they could. I just, I, I'm distracted by, like, I know it was just a throwaway gag, but I am still enjoying how casually horrifying your previous website was. Oh, Brainspace.com? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it was, to be fair, it was the website for a physical storage space mm -hmm. for brains. Uh -huh. Because, yeah. let me, t you know what, have you ever heard someone say, hey, this movie, like Bloodshot, just check your brain at the door? Sure. Uh -huh. where, where are you putting your brain when you're checking it? Mm. Come on. That's a good point. You're supposed yeah. to hold it in your hands the whole time? That's where your popcorn goes in your hands. Uh -huh. And then eventually. And it says specifically at the door, so you wouldn't do that. 
Yeah, yeah, but where at the door? I've been to movie theaters. There's not like a bucket you can just put your brain yeah, in. Yeah, that's true. So where am I supposed to, I'm just supposed to leave it on the floor where it's going to get, you know, fuzz all over it? Or in that know? box with all the 3D glasses? Exactly. Someone reaches in to get some 3D glasses so they can see a movie the way it's meant to be seen, right in your face, coming at you. <laughs> and they come out with a brain in their hands, and worse yet, it's your brain? Nobody wants that. That's a nightmare for them and for you, because now they got to figure out where this brain goes. Or worst case scenario, they just throw it away. And you come back from the movie, and you're like, oh, that was great. I really enjoyed Jingle All the Way. And you get into the bucket, and your brain's not there. And it's like, where to put my brain? Now i got to find it. Oh, man. So brainspace.com was – it really was storage space so that you could have a place where you knew your brain was but a lot of people we'd take the brain they'd pay their deposit we'd remove the brain and then you know put put them in a cab and send them off their way and we'd never get <laughs> yeah. the check in the mail for yeah. the first month's you'd rent, be like you know? i'm putting you in a cab where do you live i don't remember oh <laughs> all this again yeah yeah and so the, the, anyway so uh, speaking of which do you guys need any brains uh, like <laughs> like for eating or i don't hey it's not my job to tell you what to do with them or even to ask what you do with them. I'm just saying I've got a surplus of a certain product, human brains, and I was wondering okay. if you guys had a use for it. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I, normally I'd say yes, but at this time of scarcity, you know, send them on over. Okay, because otherwise <laughs> I'm just going to have to use my other website, spacebrain.com. That's where we fire brains into space. We don't, uh -huh. we don't have rocket ships per se. It's more of a catapult, and we just we never see them again. So we just kind of assume yeah. that they leave the atmosphere and enter probably low orbital space. Uh, we won't find out for a while until NASA they could, yeah, yeah, they could tells just us brains Yeah, landing in your neighbor's yard or something. It now, seems likely. He definitely now, said he wanted to talk to me about something. I've been kind of dodging him for a couple of weeks. Now, Griffin, you are an expert improviser. What would you say about Ellie's technique? How do you? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about expert. Uh, I, I'm loving it. I'm all the way in. Mm -hmm. um, and and speaking of improv, uh, look, I know this episode's running long. I tend to be verbose, and I, I seem to make all podcasts longer when I guest on them. I hope you guys don't mind the arrogance, <laughs> but I did come prepared with my own sponsorship, if that's fine. I'd like to do a quick oh, ad, sure. Oh, sure. if that's okay. At yeah, least we can do for your, your being with us, sure, yeah. Oh, of course. So this is my sponsorship. It is the official uh, Bloodshot action figure. Uh, let me unblur my camera uh -huh. here. Oh, wow. Um, but this is, it looks like uh, Bloodshot, the, uh, the comic book character, but it very much has Vin Diesel's uh, face, despite him never looking like this in the movie. Uh -huh. I bought this uh, two months uh -huh. before seeing the film, uh, have just had this around <laughs> my apartment. <laughs> Uh, and this was manufactured by uh, Todd McFarlane, another 90s comic edginess uh, luminary. Uh -huh. uh, so I like that. Oh, the, you think the... you'd have people manufacture it for you? No, no, he I makes know. them at home. He makes them at home. Uh, I, I have a feeling he's probably about to lose a lot of money on this. Um, so I want to just advertise them, tell people to go out. Uh, it's the one reason to break self-quarantine, to leave your house yeah. and go out and buy an American Bloodshot action figure. And Dan, to answer your earlier question about whether uh, Bloodshot in the comics uses like guns or just nanite punches people, of course, uh, Bloodshot comes with a giant knife. Uh, so oh, you can nice. nanite stab. That's my ad read. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. I, uh, I help prevent a, I, McFarlane from taking a bath on that one. Look, Tom Please. McFarlane already has. He, he wishes he had that money he spent on Mark McGuire's home run ball. You gotta, <laughs> you, you gotta help him. So not, not. You gotta help him have the money so we can waste it on more stuff. He needs to buy I, more balls. I took, folks. A, I took a photo of Griffin holding up the Bloodshot uh, action figure. Uh, this is the one time I'm gonna tell people to tweet at me if I make a mistake. Tweeted me if I've forgotten to post this on the Instagram and Twitter feeds uh, oh, once this episode drops. And I'll uh, remember to get it off my phone and onto the internet so you can all enjoy this action figure. Uh, but now let's move on uh, mm -hmm. to letters from listeners. Listeners like you? Anyway. <clears throat> This first one. <laughs> yeah, you, oh, we do have anyway. fun, Dan. <laughs> the kind of, that's the kind of uh, devil-may-care attitude <laughs> that I bring to the show. Uh, Jen, last name withheld, writes, oh, hey. Hi, Peaches. Yesterday I got offered my dream job. I'm simultaneously incredibly excited about it while also fighting the nauseous feeling that I don't deserve it and or am going to fail at it. You've all had some pretty amazing jobs in your time while also being pretty open about mental health. So my question to you is, what have you done to deal with feelings of imposter syndrome? 
Thanks for all you do, Jim. Last name withheld. Um, I don't. I mean, like I, I, I know that it took me uh, <laughs> multiple years to feel comfortable at the Daily Show as a writer, uh, and some of that was just learning that like the whole thing doesn't necessarily depend on me. Like any organization you're in, uh, like you have to realize that you're in it together. And so uh, that takes a little of the like stress that might hurt yourself off of it. But you also just have to like, this is going to sound like a platitude, but you, you can't worry so much about meeting others' expectations of you. You have to worry about like what you can control. You can't control what they think of you. You can control the work that you put in, which will sort of help you feel good about yourself if you feel good about your own work and can take pride in your own work. Well, I, to add on to that is that remember that their expectations for I don't know what the job is, but congratulations on getting it. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, like Dan was saying, you're probably part of a team. Even Bloodshot was part of a team, even though the the business really did seem to rely on his work mostly. Yeah. Like yeah, if he if he failed, then the whole operation was going to fall apart. Uh, which is not a great way to build a business <laughs> that it relies on one person who you have to brainwash to do the job. Yeah. But mm-hmm. but there you know you, if you are part of a team, then like. You don't have to be 100% every day. The best is that you try to get as close to working as hard as you can to do your job, but also to remember that, like, they want you to succeed. If they gave you that job, they think you can do that job. Yeah. They're not, you're not an imposter to them. You are someone who is starting out doing a job. And so they probably understand that you're not going to be perfect right off the bat. It takes time. I remember when I started as a, a writer at The Daily Show, I already worked there for a number of years. And so I was like, I know this place. I'm going to hit it out of the park instantly. And it took me like a year until I was consistently doing well. And they knew that. And they were like, uh, I'm sure in their mind, it was like, we're hiring him because we know he can do this job. But we don't expect him to be the best at this job immediately. That's you just not what? how anything works. You what know? Elliot just said remind me of something that has helped me when it comes to performing. But I think it comes to, to, to just regular work as well. Um, I always think of that scene in The Simpsons where Lisa has that dream where uh, she's performing on stage and everyone is booing. And it's then her she's and like, Art Garfunkel and, and all the other yeah. sidekicks. And then she says to herself, why would they come just to boo us? <laughs> and I think of that whenever like, I have to go on stage for a, like a live show for the podcast or whatever. I'm just like, they're not going to come just to boo us. If they came, they want us to succeed, like Elliot yeah. said. And so your you audience just, wants you to succeed, yeah. and your your bosses want you to succeed, and they they the situation that they've put you in, and they're very aware of it is this is a person that we feel can do this job, and they are learning how to do this job, and they've just started, and they know that, and you know that because you are not an imposter, you are a person yeah. who is starting a job, and that's a yeah. real thing that you are. Yeah, only your only it. your only your enemies and jealous friends want you to fail, <laughs> and unless you got the job under false pretenses, like if you, if this is catch me if you can, then you should have imposter syndrome because you're pretending to be a doctor and you're not one, and that's terrible. I, my guess is that you went in there under true pretenses, and they know it. Everybody's aware of the deal that you are starting this job, and you're going to do great as long as you try your best and and learn it. You know, work as hard as you can. That's Possible. why it's called. Im- that's why we're talking about imposter syndrome. I thought it was. You have to convince your loved one to shoot the imposter of you <laughs> instead of you because they're evil and you're good. I mean, in right? that case, you just look for the goatee, Stuart. It's pretty easy. <laughs> no, but what if you already have a goatee? Oh, that's, yeah, if you're Kevin Smith, you're screwed. No one knows if you're the evil Kevin Smith <laughs> or just regular Kevin Smith. Yeah. Affable stoner Kevin Smith. <laughs> I imagine that would be one of those situations where uh, Kevin Smith would be like, shoot him. I'm the one in the bathrobe. Uh, I feel imposter syndrome with literally everything I do in my entire life. Um, But as someone who has had uh, a largely unsuccessful career working with uh, people who are successful at different times, uh, the biggest common thread I have found is everyone who I respect, uh, and especially respect more after I've worked with them and see how they work, also feels imposter syndrome. And everyone I know who is completely certain that they know what they're doing uh, tends to be pretty lazy and hacky at their job. In creative <laughs> I mean, yeah. fields, at least, I have found that to be the case. Well, who is the person who has the least amount of imposter syndrome is the president. And right. he is the worst at his job, and yeah. he thinks yeah. he's the best. And, like, you, you, it, yeah. that's not what you want to be. 
Right. So I think you three all offered really good lessons about uh, how you should learn to believe in yourself a little more. But also, it is important to have a little bit of a fear that you might be an imposter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, there's actually been psychological tests on this. Like people who yeah. think that they have imposter syndrome tend to be better than their jobs, and the people who have this blind faith in themselves. There's there's yes. a thing that uh that uh David Bowie said that I only know about because I think it was the moment of Zen on the Daily Show after he died because it's not like I know everything about David Bowie where he's talking about how when he was working on something and he felt really kind of frightened and unsure of himself, when it felt like he had gone too far into the ocean and couldn't feel the ground beneath his feet, that's when he did his best work and that's when he did his most exciting work because he was kind of uh, – he didn't know what he was going to do and he was afraid of it. And like I've certainly found in my career I do better work when I am unsure of myself and have to work to prove myself and really put the effort in than when I'm like, oh, yeah, I can do this. This is fine, whatever, and I don't put in the work and it's it comes out fine. You know, so I think if there's a way for you to, instead of running from that feeling, to kind of accept it and use it to help motivate yourself, that's a good yeah. thing. And if it locks you up and makes you freeze, then it's not a good thing. You should just remind yourself, like, everyone knows who you are. That's a good thing. You're not fooling anybody because there's nothing to fool about, and you're going to do fine. And, if I can throw uh, out a, a 30 me... second specific. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. If I can throw out a 30 second specific story, one of my earliest jobs was playing a, a personal assistant to Carla Gugino on a very unsuccessful TV show. And she's one of those people who I think is just like total pro, good in everything she does, acts in yeah. all different types of things, different sized roles. It's just like consummate professional I mean, actor to me. Flophouse listeners know I have no specific opinions about Carla Gugino <laughs> one way or another. Firmly established. Um, but uh, she's, I, she's, in, she's in no way my deepest crush of all living actresses. But anyway. That's... She, she rules, and I will say working with her uh, only deepened uh, my crush for her as well. But um, she, we were on set, and it was the last episode, what would turn to be the last episode of this thing ever. And she was saying, like, I have no idea what I'm going to do when this show is done. I don't know if I'm ever going to work again. And I was like, you're Carla Gugino. You're like, you, you do 18 things a year. I like, I can't believe you wouldn't think that clearly some other things are going to come along. And she said to me, like, I just had this moment. I remember my first big job when I was a kid was working on a movie where I played Donald Sutherland's daughter. And on the last day of filming, he said to me, and then this wraps and I don't know if I ever work again. And I couldn't believe that Donald Sutherland didn't know that he was going to work again. And I now realize that I feel the same way. Yeah. Elliot, do you need to do any family stuff? I saw one of your children uh, <laughs> come in behind you as if we were in that viral video uh, of the newscaster. <laughs> no, it, was, it was very funny. From my point of view, uh, my uh, I, it was my younger son and my wife bursting in at the same time and then her pull, <laughs> pulling him away. Yeah. <laughs> as, it was as a pretty if good was, recreation as if... of that. <laughs> It was yeah. really funny. It was great. But, uh, he just, it just means he's up from his nap. And he's, he's at the point in his life where whichever parent he's with is not the one he wants to be with. Oh. He yeah. wants to be with the other one. So. He's got FOMO. Yeah, exactly. Uh, That's fear of momming out. Well, yeah. let's, uh, we'll, Father we'll try or and... mom, oh no. That's FOMO. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try and keep the speed up with the rest of the show then so you can uh, go comfort Gabriel. So I can get back to my family, who I love. <laughs> I mean, some would argue that the podcast is a great source of semi-reliable income during this, this uh, time of uncertainty. But uh, I mean, it still doesn't trump love. I don't. <laughs> it's, you're right, Dan. You're right, Dan. I should put the money over my family <laughs> um, and then shout and then rain it down on them. Uh, let's see here. Uh, John, last name with L, writes our second and final letter of the show. Dear floppers, I'm writing about your episode on Mortal Engines. On it, Elliot heckled the movie writers for picking stupid names for its characters, which hit home <laughs> as our daughter is named Hester. We named Ooh. our daughter Hester. Ooh. We named our daughter. He <laughs> wow. I like Hester. We named our no, daughter Hester. No, no, no. This is, no, this is, me, this is everyone going like, ooh, I can't believe Elliot did that. Ooh. Oh, okay. Uh, we named our daughter Hester because we enjoyed the name and the nice literary tie-in to the Scarlet Letter. When we saw that Mortal Engines was coming out with a lead protagonist named Hester, we were afraid it would be a hit, and everyone would think that we named her after it. Thankfully, it was as unpopular as it was terrible. 
My question is, <laughs> what other times has a movie ruined a name for you that would have been otherwise nice to use? Keep flopping, John Elliot. I'm pretty sure you have opinions about names and movies. I just well, uh, that's I I don't have a direct answer for his question, but I would say that uh, my life uh, being yeah. named Elliot which I don't know if the letter writer is available, but it was also the name of the main character of what it was at one point the biggest movie in the history of movies and the world. <laughs> uh, that certainly has been a, uh, a, cro- a minor cross for me to bear through my life. And I have yeah. to say that like, as, uh, as much as I love that movie, that movie, of course, being Pete's Dragon, in which the <laughs> dragon is named Elliot. <laughs> no, but like that, that E.T. came out when I was like, a f- I think, half a year old. So it was like my entire life that's been... The, the, the go-to point people have for the name Elliot. But at the same time, like, and it was really horrible because every time I'd meet someone, they'd go, Elliot. Yeah, it's a specific way eh? of saying the name. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I have to admit that, like, I got through it, and now I never get that from anybody. And yeah. it makes me a little sad now that E.T. has, I guess, slipped so far off the popular consciousness that, like, when people hear my name, they're like, hey, nice to meet you. And they like don't even make the joke. So I mean, it might be partly sword, because you know? you're interacting mostly with adults now. Uh, I would get it from adults all the time <laughs> until like a few years ago. Yeah, okay. uh, and uh, Mr. Jason Jones of the Daily Show with John Stewart would do it every time we had a conversation, <laughs> even after I'd known him for well, years. He's kind of a jerk. <laughs> well, he's he's just a guy that he needles a people. lovable but, jerk. But uh, the but yeah, so I would say. Uh, I think it's good. It's good for your name to be uh, your child's name to be something that is uh, associated with them and not already associated with something else. But on the yeah. other hand, I lived through it, and look at me. Now I'm the most famous Elliot in the world, <laughs> probably right. I yep, will yeah. say also, yep. I I still on a daily basis have to deal with both a Gryffindor and Newman from Seinfeld. I'm getting it from both angles. Oh yeah, oh, that's yeah. terrible. So oh, I, I used I, to get Cato Kalin. For Ellie oh, Kalen, yeah. and it was like, and luckily that's not something that happens anymore. But yeah, it's bad when both your names are. Uh, so there was a guy that uh, I used to work with that uh, I think Dan still works with. It. He's still at the Daily Show, right? The guy whose last name was Blog. And he was like, mm-hmm. yeah, I used to just get made fun of for having a weird name. But now I get made fun of for having a name that's a word. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I uh, I get Stewie from Family Guy or uh, the Stuart character from the sketches on the hit mad mm. tv television show <laughs> which is great because wow. when people bring up those references i'm like great i don't have to talk to you at all you have no <laughs> yeah. sense of humor person very uh, strange the uh and i also i have a i have a friend named junior and i am an enormous asshole because i can't not <laughs> say it with a sean connery accent <laughs> i'm such a fucking dick yeah i will say though that, i and- mean like i see a silver lining in what the the letter writer said because the only sort of bright side to bloodshot uh, bombing theatrically is that i can get away with naming my future son bloodshot newman <laughs> <laughs> the name is and now no one clear. Think that's weird yeah. no <laughs> And and he has to be a uh, a piano player in a tavern. Oh, of course. <laughs> and I want to make it clear to the letter writer that I think Hester is a very nice name in real life. I just yeah. thought it's it's one of those names where when you give it to a character in a fantasy story, you're like, oh, okay, that's the way it's going to be. Like if I met someone named uh, – like, like there's an actress who's on the show uh, Foils War whose first name is Honeysuckle, and it's like, okay – great but if there was if i saw a movie and they were like what's your name oh i'm honeysuckle i'd be like forget it get out of here <laughs> <laughs> like in a in a fictional world you just like i i gotta take i'm gonna i have i can take less uh whimsy i don't know yeah. no understandable okay well let's i mean we all liked bloodshot but uh normally our recommendation section is sort of a don't watch that watch this sort of thing but you know if if you are one of the many people uh, who are spending more time indoors these days, maybe you got time to watch both Bloodshot and whatever nonsense we'll recommend. I uh, just rewatched a movie that I know I saw as a child, but I've forgotten any, everything about it, so it was new to me, uh, which was Funny Face, uh, the Audrey Hepburn, Fred Astaire uh, movie. Now I'm not gonna make. I'm gonna. I'm gonna present the counter argument to funny face first and then present the pro argument the counter argument uh-huh. is that fred astaire was 30 years older than audrey hepburn 
which uh, uh, plays very strangely. Although I, I did some research. Apparently, she was a supporter of him for the role. And also, Fred Astaire always seems so sexless that it's not as creepy as it might be with a different actor. But it is not the greatest. And also, the central romantic conflict is Fred Astaire getting immediately possessive of Audrey Hepburn once they are briefly together. And uh, the movie makes a feint at uh, presenting his possessive behavior as a bad thing before showing that the guy that Audrey Hepburn was talking to is a cad and possible assaulter. Uh, So Mm -hmm. it excuses his behavior. The pro case is that uh, it's it's funny, it's colorful, uh, it's got the George Gershwin music. If you want to hear what Audrey Hepburn sounds like uh, singing, uh, don't go to My Fair Lady while she, where she's dubbed. Go to this movie. Uh, she was a trained ballerina, and she does some dance uh, numbers that are pretty impressive when you don't think of Audrey Hepburn uh, in that light. Um, also, Audrey Hepburn and Fred Astaire, two of the most charismatic people ever to be on uh, movie screens and also Kay Thompson the third the third lead in it um, I did some research on her she was the coach for a bunch of big Hollywood stars like Judy Garland and Fred Astaire or sorry uh, and uh, Frank Sinatra but she only had four film roles and this was by far the biggest and she all but steals the movie she, she also she wrote Eloise, right? She wrote Eloise. That's the other weird thing about her. She had a, a, an amazing career. Look her up. Um, but uh, it's just a it's a fun light movie in these trying times. It was exactly what I needed to see at that time. So funny face. Cool. Who wants to go next? Uh, I'll jump in. Uh, I'm going to recommend a movie that is uh, it's a bit of a selfish recommendation, um, but I am recommending a documentary called Death by Metal. It is a documentary about the heavy metal band Death and the front man, uh, Chuck Schuldner, and kind of tracks his... It's kind of like a VH, uh, VH1 behind the music for this extreme heavy metal band and the like rise and uh, eventual death of this uh, kind of phenomenal heavy metal musician. Uh, They're one of my favorite bands. Uh, It's really interesting for me, and it's cool to see a bunch of these uh, these guys give interviews, these, like, crusty old heavy metal dudes give interviews years after. uh, Years after they were, like, young, uh, denim-clad maniacs uh, making music in their parents' garage. And uh, it includes, like, interviews with Sean Reinhart, who uh, passed away a few months ago, which is pretty sad. But um, uh, it's one of my favorite bands, Death, and uh, it's a pretty fun little documentary. It's on uh, Amazon Prime. Now, you say that that's selfish, and you're saying that just because uh, it is a thing that you like, Stuart? Or, well, uh... I say it's selfish because it's... Uh, I don't know how interesting it would be for people... Uh, who are not interested in sure. that specific like subgenre of extreme heavy metal, <laughs> uh, like death metal. You know, it's it's like eating spicy food. Like uh, it would be like eating a fucking ghost pepper first, and not <laughs> like working your way up. Like it'll sound like right. garbage if you haven't listened to this sort of thing. And- I, I guess it, you're saying it might not have the same wide interest as the usual uh, Korean shock horror or direct-to-video <laughs> ninja <laughs> movies <laughs> that you like to recommend. That's true, yeah. It's usually it's you... more of a selective audience than the, <laughs> as, uh, you know, the, you know, the family features I usually recommend. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I just, I brought it up because I think that there's a certain uh, level of, if you don't know us by now, uh, of all of our recommendations, <laughs> that yeah. it can be assumed that if you like this kind of thing that Dan or Stuart Alley like, maybe you'll like this other thing. Uh, well, speaking if, of, if you like this kind of... Th- oh, sorry, what did you say? No, I, I mean, uh, you go first. I have a connection to what was just said, but it will still apply in a second. <laughs> oh, oh, then yeah. you, then you oh, go, great. and then I'll go last. You go, and then I'll go last. Well, if, if I can alley-oop off of uh, what, what Stuart likes, uh, I'm going to recommend a movie that uh, by chance already came up in this conversation, uh, Universal Soldier Day of Reckoning, the fourth uh, yeah. Universal Soldier movie, the second direct-to-video one. Uh, with Scott Atkins, King of VOD Action. Uh, it is a movie that is very, very similar yeah. to Bloodshot in a lot of ways. 
Uh, in certain countries and on certain platforms, it seems to have been retitled Universal Soldier, A New Dimension now. So if you're looking for it, that's the same movie. Uh, but it, it's similarly about uh, memories and uh, uh, someone who has sort of been programmed to be in an action movie. Um, and is is the kind of movie that you should be comparing Bloodshot to and not uh, Iron Man. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it also has a little bit of the same meta commentary because it has Van Damme as this ac- aging yeah. star and, and Dolph Lundgren as this aging guy, both of whom are like, Van Damme gives his best like Colonel Kurtz impression in this movie. Uh, I'm going to recommend a movie that uh, similarly also to these, if you like the kinds of things that I like, then you might like it. I'm going to recommend, this is a Western called Doc from 1971. It's about Doc Holliday and is meant to be a kind of like gritty, uh, anti-heroic retelling of the gunfight of the OK Corral. And stars Stacey Keach as Doc Holliday, Faye Dunaway uh, plays Kate, and uh, Harris Eulin plays Wyatt Earp. Harris Eulin, you may remember best as the judge who put away the Scolari brothers in Ghostbusters 2, <laughs> among other things. Uh, and he's but really... he gave him the chair! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, he's... They're, they're, uh, it's a real, like, it's a movie that I was not super familiar with. It's directed by Frank Perry, who directed, like, uh, The Swimmer and Mommy Dearest and Diary of a Mad Housewife, this guy who had this very uh, idiosyncratic career. And uh, it's and it was written by Pete Hamill, the, uh, the, like, newspaper columnist and memoir writer. And it manages to sometimes be a little too, like, super grit for its own good, and that characters call each other, like, bitch out of nowhere and stuff like that. But <laughs> it's such a strangely like low key and yet tense and at times very exciting and at times very like touching story about a guy who is now trapped in a life that he can't seem to get out of and also the breakdown in a friendship between doc holiday and wyatt earp and things like that and uh, they're all really great in it and i really liked it a lot it's a movie that i was not familiar with before and i went and walked away from it being like oh i'm surprised i haven't heard more about this so that's doc starring stacy keach faye dunaway and of course harris Eulin. Okay. cool four recommendations uh, plus bloodshot yep uh okay well this is the point in the podcast where we normally would just be like you know go out and spread the word of the flop house but i think that at least for the duration of the um of the pandemic we want to more spread the message of take care of yourselves uh if you're in a place where you have the emotional and or money resources to take care of others uh we would encourage you to do that as well um, you know, we're glad that we can provide whatever service we ever provide to anyone during this time, and uh, we want you all to be well. Uh, uh, and that's what I have to say about that. Mm-hmm. We got a lot of nodding from everyone else, a lot of empathetic nodding. I, I mentioned before, but I, I'd been pretty sick with symptoms uh, matching the COVID 19, uh, and I am feeling almost 100% better, and I feel very lucky that I've been able to isolate and and get healthy again. Yeah. If anybody was worried about me. No, yes, I, I, feel, I feel very lucky that you have been able to get healthy again, Stuart. So if you anyone... could have found a new Stuart. No, I <laughs> love We're... you, Stuart. I mean, Griffin seems to like a lot of the same stuff That's that true. you do, so I don't yeah, know. Yeah. It's, well, yeah. Uh, it's more of a anyone... two Elliot situation to have Griffin join the... <laughs> you mean heaven? You mean the definition of heaven on earth? Yeah, sure it is. Uh, I would never our, talk again. <laughs> to, to all of our listeners, we hope you're healthy. We hope the people in your lives are healthy. If you're not doing well right now, we hope you are through it and feeling better soon. Uh, and what Dan said, do what you can to help other people. And otherwise, uh, please take care of yourself. And uh, as uh, my, my friend Jenny Jaffe has said to me, uh, let's not all, for any of the creative types listening out there, let's not all feel bad if at the end of this we haven't written the great American novel with this time we supposedly have on our hands. <laughs> Job one is just taking care of ourselves and take care of each other. Yeah. And let's while, while she's ourselves. busy being on the fucking front page of Reddit, right? <laughs> I, do, I do not. That? I don't know about that. I do oh, not have the focus to read a novel during this time, let yeah. alone write one. So um, you've been doing a lot of dress up, right? <laughs> been doing a lot of. Elliot, you made fun of that earlier. I mean, like, that is the level of distraction <laughs> I need during this. 
Uh, I was I've, I was only making fun of it in terms of that you sent us the the letter questions this morning. Uh, yeah. rather, uh, when I was like, oh, he seems to have a lot of time on his hands. I don't think that's a coronavirus <laughs> thing. But uh, no, no. Um, uh, now that we have elected to not promote ourselves, Griffin, do you have anything you want to plug yes, or promote? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely gonna plug uh, taking care of yourself and taking care of others in this weird time. That's my primary plug. Oh, I'm gonna brave, I'm gonna brave. second that from all of you guys. Um, oh, what a hero. And then uh, Blank Check Podcast, uh, my podcast with David Sims, who's a critic for The Atlantic, uh, which all three of you yeah. have been on. Uh, we, we discussed yeah, that's the a, it's like Candidate the... remake. Yeah. Yeah, it's the Cadillac of movie podcast. Oh, no. I don't, I don't actually it... don't know enough about cars to figure out what we are. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the, I feel like if the, the Blank Check Podcast is kind of like the Flatbus if we knew what we were doing and put work into it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like if we if we were any good at this and also were better at it, but also it I think you check. can vaguely map our personalities onto the totally check personalities. <laughs> totally. So if you like this show, you like that show as well. It was a, it was you, a shame you, our, you... pro, our producer Ben was not there when you guys recorded, and that's a pretty mm-hmm. clean mapping of three onto three. Yeah. <laughs> My only uh, request is that listeners from this podcast go listen to Blank Check podcast, but come back and also listen to you our show. listen to both. You gotta. Don't feel like your needs are being met just by the other one because I know I know what the feelings You know, be. pick um, the favorite one. You don't have to tell us which one you no. like better. We would prefer Keep it in not, your heart. but yeah. think of the other one as methadone. Sure. For the, yeah. the one you like the best. No, just yeah. just you can fit both of them in your life. Just put them on two times speed and have your brain leak out of your nose when Elliot talks. <laughs> you're you're not taking it to get high anymore. You're just taking it to stay even, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just to reach zero. Just and I to also, reach level. I, I want to promote very relevant and topical. Thank you for reminding me, uh, Dan. I'm doing a weekly Instagram uh, live show with my younger sister uh, called Marilyn Vin, where she picks a Meryl Streep movie and I pick a Vin Diesel movie, uh, our two favorite movie stars, respectively, and we compare <laughs> them. So I'm doing that every Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, but then it stays up online for, I think, 24 hours afterwards. Uh, so what, movies, what movies have you done so far? Uh, we've, we've just started it. We did it. The first installment was Bloodshot uh, versus Mamma Mia 2, Here We Go Again. But that was before <laughs> we figured out how to save the video. So this remains uh, my only record of uh, Bloodshot opinions. So you guys have uh, the exclusive. Um, oh, good. Oh, cool. And That's then the word we got scooped. Week 2 was Babylon AD versus The Hours. <laughs> Uh, was, wow. Babylon I, was that our lost episode? I think that was yeah, our lost episode. Really? Babylon yeah. Babies. We uh, recorded it and then somehow it disappeared. So. Well, that's pretty perfect because that movie uh, pretty much doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I'm eager for you to do the A Man Apart, uh, I don't know, Ricky and the Flash yes. combo. <laughs> I, I think sure. A Man Apart is going to be this week at the time that we're recording because that is uh, a Babylon AD, Man Apart, and Knockaround guys are the only Vin Diesel movies I had not seen before. Uh, so oh, I'm trying cool. to fill in the blind spots before I go into rewatching everything. <laughs> I think I may have seen Knockaround guys and remember nothing about it. Uh, as I think most of America yeah. feels about Knockaround most guys. Most of America saw Knockaround guys. <laughs> it doesn't totally remember. That's why it was well, the single was... most profitable movie yeah, in the history was, of film. It was sent out with the <laughs> census forms. A DVD <laughs> of Knockaround guys. <laughs> they, they, yeah. said, they said, please classify your ethnicity yeah. uh, and how many people are in your household. What did you think about Knockaround yeah, guys? Which mandatory the Knockaround fun. guys do you identify yeah. with? It was like coupon the um, movie. <laughs> Uh, all right well thank you griffin for being here i think that we can say that this movie or this movie this podcast was 100 percent better having the world's uh most foremost and funniest vin diesel fan oh. on to talk about it my pleasure and no title i will wear with more honor than the ones you just assigned to me <laughs> <laughs> so uh until next time i've been dan mccoy i'm Stuart wellington i'm elliot kalen and Griffin is. Oh, I looking... didn't know I was supposed to say my name. I'm sorry. I'm Griffin Newman. <laughs> okay. That's... Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. So long. Bye. Bloodshot. Yes. Now, Dan, something I do often is I have notes. I have a rundown of the episode on my computer, and I have the name <laughs> of the movie on there. <laughs>
MaximumFun.org. Comedy and culture. Artist owned. Audience supported.